and um apparently from what i've heard is that they they like didn't tell him really anything about the game like he he pretty much knew nothing about it and just kind of slapped the song together but uh yeah no akira yamaoka on this one we've got original score by Daniel Leet who was rest in peace one of the main composers for a lot of stuff out there I think he did the most known for like the TV show Dexter not the cartoon but the a live action show. But yeah. No Akira Yamaoka. And kind of a jarring intro. Should tell you right away. This is a very different kind of Silent Hill game. Obviously, we didn't end the series with a game kind of reminiscent of the originals. I would say this game is one of the ones that has turned around a lot in the fan base over the last like nine years since it's come out. When it first came out, I feel like everybody sort of unanimously really hated this game. I feel like I only heard about fans shitting on this game when it came out. I was not a fan of it when it came out. A lot of people who were out there making Silent Hill content at the time, uh, YouTube videos, stuff like that many people were not fans of it and I think it's understandable why it's something very very different from the rest of the series it's got a lot of issues um, it helps that we are playing kind of the more stable version of it we're playing the 360 version on an Xbox one if you would have been playing this originally on launch uh, for like the PlayStation 3 it was very very uh, buggy it had a lot of issues with frame rates and uh, just it was it was a much bigger mess on launch and then patches and stuff sort of came out and uh we got you know backwards compatibility next gen consoles and uh you know a little bit better more stable ways to play it that kind of took care of a lot of the bugs and issues at least for people who are still willing to play it this this late after its launch so that just kind of leaves us with the gameplay and the story. So let's get into it. Um, game difficulty and puzzle difficulty. The action aspect of this game is fucking miserable. <laughs> And there are going to be times where I'm going to be dealing with enemies. A, because this game puts you in a lot of situations where you kind of have to. And B, because there's going to be a lot of places where I'm doing something optional that I want to try to show. And uh, yeah, there's no point in just making things more annoying to deal with. So we're going to be leaving the game difficulty on easy just to give ourselves that much of a break. But we'll still be talking quite a bit about kind of the really clunky, nasty combat for this one. Puzzle difficulty will bump up to hard and wish that there was more. Because even on hard mode, um, very little changes with the puzzles. There's, there's not a whole lot of difference with uh, things that we're going to be doing as far as puzzles throughout the playthrough. So I'll talk a little bit about puzzle difficulty and kind of the changes between it um there's a lot of side quests and stuff for this game i don't think this is going to be a hundred percent playthrough i will stop and go out of my way and do a few things that are kind of there some of them i think are a little more interesting than others one in particular i think is is kind of neat but for the most part i feel like most of the side quests and things are not really worth it um, so we're more going to be just kind of focusing on like the overall main plot of the game. And yeah, there's a lot of, uh, 
long cutscenes in this game. Unskippable cutscenes. I said I wouldn't be skipping them for a uh, in-depth like this anyway. But long, long cutscenes. It's all set. Make it quick, huh? Follow me. All right. So we start off. See our main character here, Murphy on, Pendleton. Murphy, stop screwing around. I don't have all day. Being led through a prison by one of the prison guards. Oh. Officer Sewell. It's just you. Wayward Son, thank you so much for the primary sub. The 46 months. Very much appreciate that, Wayward Son. Thank you, thank you. Hope you're doing well tonight. He's all yours now. Make it quick, Cupcake. Hey, almost forgot. I left you a little present on the bench. Have fun. But this is Silent Hill Downpour. It uh, It is very, very different from the rest of the series. It's not tied into, like, any of the rest of the games. We don't really have that, like, cult sort of subplot aspect going. The town itself looks and acts very differently from previous games. Powers Shit! around Silent Hill are really different with this one. Uh, You're not changing your mind, are you? There we go. We get a little extra dialogue if we wait and don't go in right away. Magic Mush. Thank you so much for the Prime sub. Very much appreciate that. Thank you. But, um, yeah. So we're going to be following the story of Murphy Pendleton. This prisoner, are we we're gonna going be... to do this, or are you just wasting my time? Nice. I think that might be the last of it. I want to wait and see if he says something else, though. Um, but yeah, the story's not great. It's uh, it's definitely. I would say its biggest problem. It's it's kind of predictable, which makes it kind of boring. Tick tock, Murphy. Let's speed this up. Yep, he's still still going at it. But we'll be going through. We'll be talking about Murphy, what he did, how he wound up here. And more or less what's going on with the story. Although this game's story... Yeah. A lot of plot holes. A lot of things that don't really add up. And a lot of info that was left out of the game. We're going to be making some references to a comic book. I think we've got all of his uh, dialogue now. So we're going to be making references to uh, a comic book that came out. And it was made by the same writer. You know, same people involved with the game. How are you talking on the intercom when I can see you right there? Well, what are you waiting for? Turn on the damn shower so the camera will catch everything we do. Dumbass. Again, we get some more dialogue here just by not acting or doing anything. But yeah, I'll be uh, making reference to a comic. Um, I'm not going to take the time to, like, pull up 
too many pages or anything from the comic. I might for one or two things. But um, I'll be making reference to a comic. <laughs> Almost lunchtime. He's, uh, he's getting more and more impatient. Perfect. Just like new viewers to the channel. Like, why won't this guy just play? He's just standing around talking. Yep, that's what we do here. We stand around and we talk instead of playing. But there is... Um, there is a comic book called Anne's Story that covers a lot of what's going to be going on from one of our other main characters' perspectives, Anne Cunningham. And it fills in a lot of the blanks of things that this game desperately needed to explain. So whenever information and stuff is kind of relevant to the comic, I'll bring that up. And the comic is out there. You can get it online. It's it's there's digital versions of it out there that are usually pretty cheap or free. Uh and then it also had physical copies printed, if you're more of the collector type. And the comic is actually pretty good. It's it's decent. I would say that I like the comic more than this game. I would have liked the comic to have been the actual game. But then again, I would have liked all of what was in the comic to just be in the game playable anyway. We're Sewell. There's been a mistake. I'm a sequestered prisoner. You're not supposed to be here. Guards? Officer Sewell, hello? You don't recognize me, do you? What? No, I... Guard! Guards! Anybody? We used to be neighbors. of my rights. Who the hell do you think you are? When I talk to the warden, I... No one's listening. Help! Jesus, help me! Alright. X to attack. Well, let's explain a little bit about who we're attacking and why. So just like all good old traditional Silent Hill games, we're starting off with a nightmare. But uh, Murphy is having a nightmare about an event that, for the sake of explaining this game, we'll say actually happened. But because of the way this game plays out, because of the different endings, and because there's nothing to really make the plot make sense, we just kind of have to assume things. It'll make more sense <laughs> as we explain the game and get through it and see the end. But um, to make things a bit easier to explain, Murphy's essentially reliving or having a nightmare about an experience where he was in prison and had an arrangement with one of the guards named Officer Sewell to have an opportunity to attack and kill this man, Patrick Napier. Patrick Napier is a pedophile and child abuser. Who was here in prison, sequestered prisoner, as he says. And he is, is the one responsible for kidnapping and killing Charlie Pendleton, Murphy's son. 
So Murphy went through a lot of trouble getting himself arrested and getting put here just so that he could have the opportunity to get revenge on Napier. And luckily, one of the guards, Officer Sewell, was shady and crooked enough to sort of let that happen be able to set that up for him. But, in exchange, he would want a favor. He would want Murphy to kill somebody else. But he wouldn't specify who until it was time to do it. So the other person is another officer by the name of Officer Coleridge. Officer Coleridge is the father of one of the characters that we're gonna be seeing later, Anne Cunningham, which is who the comic book focuses on. Um, again, that comic is called Anne's Story. Silent Hill Downpour, Anne's Story. But Anne's Cunning Anne Cunningham's father, depending on the ending that you get, was basically critically injured either by Murphy or by Sewell and Anne blamed Murphy for it regardless of who actually was responsible so Anne is seeking revenge against Murphy she's going out of her way to get Murphy transferred to a new prison so that she would have the opportunity to kill him much like Murphy went through the trouble of getting put into prison in the first place just to get revenge on Napier. So that's kind of the whole plot. That's kind of the whole story of Downpour, is revenge is bad, don't try to do it, because it never works out the way you think. But that is where we're starting off from here with this story, is Murphy reliving this nightmare or reliving as a nightmare this experience of attacking and killing Patrick Napier, the man who kidnapped and killed his son. And the game just doesn't give you any option to do anything different, so... Sorry, Patrick. Where does the part about Silent Hill kick in? Uh, we go there. <laughs> we go to there. It it doesn't really need to be a Silent Hill game. Like, very little has to do with the town itself. The town is just sort of a way for the story to be expressed in like an, a more interesting way. There we go. Good old Silent Hill intro. Beating up a person. Very violently. With no context as to why. Pendleton. Come on, rise and shine, Cupcake. You know the drill. Guess today's a big day, huh? To tell you the truth, I'm sort of sorry to see you go. Prisoner secure. Open 302B. Transfer.
How does this dude not get the chair? Known pedo kidnapped and killed a kid and he isn't executed. I mean, not all... Not all places in the U.S. even use the death penalty. Some are more... Some places it's more easy to get it than others. And even then, like, it doesn't happen right away. You're gonna be... You're gonna be convicted and serve time for a long time, even if you are going to be getting the death penalty. So while during his time incarcerated leading up to that death penalty, even if Napier would have gotten it, he wouldn't just be getting the chair like immediately. He'd still be in the prison system for years before it happened. find out what this what Murphy owes this guy but he ain't gonna forget that shit yeah like so this is probably the best song in the whole game it's called perp walk and it's Daniel leaked trying to do a Kiriyamaoka style we get Mary Elizabeth McGlynn for the little vocal riff there So, right here at the very beginning, just for this intro to try to, like, get the player lured in. Like, see? Yamaoka's not here, but the music still sounds pretty good. You've got this super violent intro. Like, all this stuff going on. They're trying to make it interesting. Don't worry, it will fall apart. At least for me, it does. A lot of people, this game has found its audience. There's a lot of people who are big fans of it. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna make anybody feel bad. If you like this game, that is totally fine. Like, these are just opinions on video games. It's not a big deal. But for me, this game really falls short in a lot of very critical ways. But we'll be going over it. Well, guess this is it. No fond farewell? You gonna miss us? Not even a little. <laughs> Give it a couple of days at Wayside Max. I bet you'll start to miss this place after all. Cause we sure are gonna miss you. Wayside. Move them out! So, Murphy's being transferred. From Ryall State Prison to Wayside Max Security. And it's a setup that he's being transferred with this group of prisoners. This all was arranged by another guard, Anne Cunningham, who we see here. So this is the daughter of Officer Coolridge that I explained in the beginning was very critically injured, nearly killed, and was then put under intensive care uh, and in the care All of Anne Cunningham now, for the last part of his life. Let's get this done. So that she could have yeah. this opportunity. All right. You heard the lady. Mount up. Mm -hmm. What we got here? All she wanted was her opportunity to be able to get her revenge on Pendleton. Pendleton. Get on the bus. So that's her taking her moment. That's her taking her moment to be like, I've got you, you fucker. I had to do so much shit to have my chance to kill you and get my revenge. And now I finally can. So I know it's a meme and everything, talking about get on the bus, but there is some impact to it.
you have a good nap, Wero? Tell me something, puta. That you what I heard about you? Did you really do it? Shut the hell up! Fuck you, Wero! I said lock it up, damn it! Silent Hill Downpour. Title drop. Just realized the driver's name is Coons. Yep. There's actually, in the comic book, there's a whole scene with him. There's like a whole... Anne Cunningham wakes up after the car crash, or after the bus crash. And uh, he's like a zombie, standing up and all fucked up and after the accident and talking to her. Like, blaming her. But then she realizes she's just kind of seeing things. But it's Silent Hill fucking with her head, I guess. They're not very clear on those kind of things in this game. <laughs> not necessarily okay. a bad thing. Think. Find the highway. Put some ground between yourself and the bus. Nope. We're going to put less ground. We're going to examine the bus. We're going to get closer. Ryall State Correctional Facility. Like I said, Murphy was being transferred from Ryall State over to Wayside Max. All because of Anne Cunningham. She literally had to sleep with the warden and do a bunch of other what she calls sick things. just to be able to get her hands on Murphy. Just to have an opportunity to kill him and get revenge. Whoa. Because she believes Murphy is responsible for her father's death. Whoa! Couldn't possibly step over this. No way I could make it over this log. This is the kind of shit that, like, come on, just... You could make the ground be a literal just landslide or whatever. You can, if you're going to have like an invisible wall for the character to not be able to get past, don't make it something they could very easily get past. But Anne Cunningham... She blames Murphy for her father's death. Depending on what ending you get, sometimes it is Murphy's fault, sometimes it's not. Sometimes none of it actually happened anyway. This is one of those games that's kind of the king of, like, who fucking cares <laughs> because of the way the endings are set up. It's left open to interpretation. Hello? How much of this game is even actually me, real? Or, like supposed to be have been happening in any sort of context whereas like you look at something like Silent Hill 2 water's freezing and it's got a big variety of endings none of those endings really change what happened like to the characters leading up to the events of the game and throughout the events of the game it just changes how everything concludes at the end this game, the endings completely change the context of everything in the game. It it changes the context of if Murphy was even in prison. It changes the context of who Anne Cunningham is, let alone, like, if he's guilty or, you know, if their revenge is justified or anything like that. Which, I don't know, I guess is fine. A lot of people are fine with that and just leaving it super open-ended but I feel like it just makes it hello confusing can anyone hear me needlessly confusing confusing for the sake of being confusing
you change how the character's development concludes, whereas this game changes the events that kickstart everything. That about right. Exactly. And when you have multiple endings that sort of give you the idea that none of this was real, the accident. it just takes away so much of the like implied meaning. If they would have stuck with certain aspects of the game's story always being concurrent, you know, like... Murphy was definitely in prison, you know. Murphy definitely killed Napier as revenge for Charlie. If they would have kept certain aspects like that concurrent for all the endings, but then had the endings change, you know, how different characters react and branch off kind of from there, that would make a lot more sense. Uh, I think it would have helped a lot of the game's sort of issues with its plot. Are they okay? Yeah, he's fine. He ate a bunch of raspberries and fell asleep. We've all been there. I'm just gonna borrow his flashlight. And the thing is, there's times where this game, like, looks okay. Like, visually, it's definitely not the worst. I, I feel it's lacking in style a little bit. And there's going to be a lot of reuse of... A little bit too much reuse in, like, props and settings where you're going through locations and it's, like, the exact same walls, the exact same building fronts, same windows, same doors... Uh, there's all sorts of major, major prop elements to, like, put together your locations that you're going through that are reused instead of kind of more unique, interesting-looking areas. Again, I hate to, like, call back to it, but by this point, if you're just even looking at main titles, this is the eighth Silent Hill game. So it's... There's a lot of people who are like, you know, it's unfair to you know, compare Downpour to the other Silent Hill games, judge it on its own merit. And I'm like, okay. But it's also the eighth Silent Hill game. So asking somebody to not compare it to the seven other games in a franchise before it is kind of stupid as well. And especially if you can point to something that was, like, on the PlayStation 2 nine years before this game came out. Something like Silent Hill 3, where I I see a way across. it keeps that uh, that prop reuse to kind of a bare minimum. Areas and locations are a lot more interesting and unique without uh, repeating textures and things like that too much. Because when you do that too much throughout this game, it, it winds up making the environments feel very boring. There's so many people who've, you know, people who are fans of this game that I kind of talk to and ask, like, what is it you like about this game? Because I do want to, I would like to enjoy this game more. I would like to see it from a perspective where I can enjoy it more. I, I think anybody would agree to that with, like, any game uh, out there. Like, if you could, if you could enjoy a game more, then why wouldn't you? Um... So I try to get other people's perspective on stuff like this, and it's like, well, you can explore the town. There's so much to explore. And it's like, it's a bunch of houses that look exactly alike, rooms that look exactly alike, with the same couple of enemies that are not great enemy designs, usually to just get, you know, a little extra health or bullets or something. And I'm like, eh exploring the town and stuff like that would be nice if there was something more interesting to look at. If, if it felt a little more gratifying doing that exploring and side questing. Also, balance beams. That really makes you feel like you're playing a Silent Hill game, right? Remember during the Silent Hill 1 playthrough a couple weeks ago when I started this uh, this year's series of in-depths? I was going through Silent Hill 1 
And there's a part in the very beginning where Harry walks across a fallen tree to get to a mailbox and get a key out of that mailbox. And Harry just fucking sprints across. Just like, no problem. Sprint across the tree, grab the key out of the mailbox, sprint back across the tree the other way. No balance beam, no nothing, no bullshit, no screaming. That's the attitude. That's what we want in our Silent Hill protagonists. Not, not somebody screaming and yelling every time they have to squeeze their way onto any sort of platform smaller than like three feet across. That's far enough. Get your ass down on the ground now. Hands where I can see them. Do it. Take it easy. I'm not going anywhere. I said, on the ground now. I was just looking for help. And you just I... happened to lose your cuffs in the process? Save the bullshit. This is stupid. I'll meet you back down at the bus, okay? You're gonna get yourself killed. Shut up. Keep your goddamn hands where I can see them. Uh, I don't know. Let me think about it. Let me stare at this button prompt and think about it. Just give me a moment, and there's no timer, so there's no sense of desperation. All the language, so edgy. Yeah, they definitely try to go for that. It, it feels like homecoming in that way. It feels like they're going for, like, look, we do things a little more gory and a little more violent and... You're just, like, knifing a guy in prison in the showers in the beginning of the game, and everyone's saying fucking shit. I don't know. Um, I'm fine with that. I'm I'm fine with, like, a level of edge to, to the horror game, but it needs to feel natural to, like, the characters, and the problem is it doesn't feel natural. It feels very tacked on just for the sake of being edgy. We're just going to sit here and consider these these options. Help her and leave her. And we're going to pretend that there's any real meaning behind them. I mean, there's there kind of is, but not as much influence as you would think. Again, it's like Homecoming. We were talking about Homecoming having these dialogue, branching dialogue choices and stuff, and how there's only like a handful of them that even influence anything in the game. This game kind of does the same thing. It, uh, it doesn't influence a whole lot. It changes a little bit with how these cutscenes play out, and it can affect your ending, but uh, a little bit more than Homecoming. But there's still not as much impact felt. Um, people were asking what ending I'm going to go for. I, I don't really know. I didn't have one two in mind with this. Let's be nice. We'll help. Hang on. I'm slipping. Oh, God. Don't let go. Don't. Ah! Shit. Damn it. Yep. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And Murphy's reaction is just like so underwhelming. That's the way that I yell shit, if damn it. Faster. If I'm like, damn it. Park in the car and I just barely sort of like bump the tire against the curb. Shit! Damn it. Now I gotta back up and inch the car over a little more. Hopefully, it didn't bend the rim. 
yeah not a whole lot of impact in your choices the yelling and everything with this I said character reactions are very weird where they just sort of I don't know there's times where they seemingly overreact to things and then other times where there's barely any reaction at all and I, again I'm going to keep going back to talking about the, the comic book so in the Anne story comic this is sort of where the comic book takes place so now we run into Anne Cunningham again throughout the game but the way that she just fell you would assume okay she's dead we move on um, the comic kind of covers what happens to Anne how she survives the fall and sort of what she's going through in the events from here up until when we see her again so with Anne she falls there's uh, some creatures around Silent Hill called weeping bats that are these big pale long limbed humanoid things so several of those are waiting for Anne down in the pit they sort of catch her and break her fall and then while she's at the bottom of the pit she's back by the bus crash she sees uh, the driver Koontz who is uh, dead but she sees him sort of after his accident all banged up and bloodied and, and basically a zombie like standing up and talking to her um, and sort of blaming her Because in a way, it is sort of her fault, but yeah, a little bit more story, a little bit more plot going on with the uh, the comic, filling in some of these blanks, some of these gaps. Instead, we just kind of see it from the perspective of the game of like, well, there goes Anne Cunningham, and then we see her again later, and it's like, how the hell are you here? Like, what all led you up to this point? So the comic fills all that stuff in and it also gives us all of Anne Cunningham's motivation we get all of her backstory uh, why she blames Murphy why she wanted to even be a corrections officer in the first place her relationship with her father how things were when she was taking care of her father after he got attacked because he didn't die right away he lived for like another year or two where Anne Cunningham was taking care of him and he was basically like in a wheelchair, couldn't go to the bathroom, couldn't feed himself, couldn't do anything. So like had to be completely cared for um, by Anne. It drove her marriage apart because she was constantly taking care of her father. Like all these aspects to Anne's character that are not in the game, that are not in the game at all for such an important character to have such important backstory. We, we had this problem with Silent Hill 4 where we're like, oh, there's some extra plot about Walter's other victims and how he knew them and why they're part of the ritual on the website. So we went off and we read that stuff and it adds a lot to the story, but it's not necessary to the story. We talked about that with Homecoming. Homecoming had all these extra diaries for Alex and L and Wheeler. All this extra stuff on the website, all this extra lore and, and stuff that was put elsewhere outside of the game. Um, which added to Homecoming. The diaries definitely gave us more to, to understand those characters, but you can still play the game and like get through and sort of get the story. Anne's story is like critical information to the game's main plot that's left completely out and put into a comic book that came out like years after the game's release. And what's interesting is after a while... Um, some some game hackers went through looking at Downpour's files. They found a lot of unused stuff, including an unused boss and some unused animations and things for Anne Cunningham. Yo, Techie. Techie, thank you so much for the raid. We're talking about Anne's story, the comic book. Hope you were enjoying Wave Break. Hope you had a good stream, dude. But, um... Yeah, with, with the Anne story comic, like it, it 
adds so much more. It adds so much more to to the main plot, understanding what's going on and like that main element. And some of that was going to be content in the game. So game hackers found a lot of stuff in the game files. Um, they found uh, a cut boss. There was going to be like a proper boss fight. The big face that you see at the end of the um, mining segment is was originally going to be a boss fight that represented Officer Sewell um, that was just completely cut from the game. And there were animations and things for Anne showing that she was going to be playable. And Tom Hewlett confirmed this when that was brought up to him on Twitter. And he mentioned that they were going to have uh, a whole separate playable scenario for Anne. They were going to have co-op where you would you and a friend could both be playing. So there would be times where you're playing as Murphy and then times where it would switch over to Anne Cunningham and then times where you're playing as both simultaneously. So there was supposed to be this sort of crossover progression where you're weaving back and forth between Murphy's side of the story and side of the story. And then the times where it sort of comes together, there would have actually been like two player stuff going on or times where you take over uh, from Anne's perspective. So a lot of the stuff that was written for Anne's story, because it was all the same writer, was most likely stuff that was meant to be originally in the game, like part of a playable scenario. And it's all just like off in a comic book. Instead, from our perspective, Anne falls in a hole and we just see her later. That's it. She doesn't tell us what happened or anything like that. Uh, Deus Ex Logic, thank you so much for the 25 bits. The Haxer's bits. Yeah. That's where the uh, road collapsed. The bus went down. Yep. Press and hold right bumper to walk while... Uh, to run... And uh, boy, that gets old. It's a it's a strictly analog control game. There's no changing your control scheme or setup or anything like that. There's Something no tank controls. So why do I need to hold a button to run? Couldn't I just move the analog stick all the way up to run, and then move it like lightly to walk? Or if you're going to have it set up this way, make it reverse. Give me like a reverse option so that I can reverse the run controls. That's been in previous Silent Hill games. That's That was in Silent Hill 1. You can, re you can reverse walk run control so that when you hold up on the analog stick, you're always running and then you would press R1 when you want to walk, which is never. Oh well, it's fine. Oh, hey, 555-4210. Five, 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 Let me just call that on my cell phone. Oh, right. <sighs> we don't have... We're not playing Shattered Memories. And they make a big deal out of, like, the inventory. They kind of change up how weapons and things work in this game. Instead of just being able to carry all the weapons, like, this is the exact opposite of Origins. People complained about Origins, and they were like, it's so silly. Why can Travis hold 27 portable TVs and, like, all these different things? So they were like, okay, fine. Silent Hill Downpour, Murphy can hold two things. You know, three if you count his flashlight. He can clip a flashlight to his belt. He can hold a melee weapon. And he can hold a gun along with a melee weapon. And that's it. And they make a big deal of, like, you only have what you can hold on, you know, Murphy's actual person instead of a proper inventory. But then they just give you an inventory anyway. Like, you can just press up on the D-pad and you open up your actual inventory where you're going to keep ammo and puzzle items and random things like that.
Game seems to be running a lot better than I remember seeing at the time. Did they fix things with patches? So there was a patch uh, to fix a lot of issues shortly within, like... Well, not shortly. After the game came out, I want to say it was a few months after, they gave you... Uh, they gave a patch to try to fix a lot of the issues. The game used to stutter a lot worse, especially whenever going in and out of certain areas where uh, the game would be saving or loading. And um, the fact that I'm running this on an Xbox One, so it's the 360 version being played on uh, an Xbox One. So makes that a lot more stable as well. Patch was only for the PS5, if I remember. PS4? No, no, no. One more generation back. PS3. This was released for the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. Um, I think eventually the Xbox did get a patch. I thought that PS3 got it first, like way ahead of Xbox. And then eventually Xbox got it as well. Some Akira Yamaoka music. They didn't have him work on... Uh, they didn't have him work on the actual game soundtrack, but they did put little snippets of Yamaoka music. See, it's got music from Silent Hill 2. Obviously means it's going to be just as good, right? Uh, you can just barely make out the paper there. John P. Sater. Murderer? Question mark? J.P. Sater. So already we're getting some uh, foreshadowing to some of the other characters in the game that we're going to be meeting later. JP. So uh, points for having stuff in the environment. Interesting little details in the environment. Again, I wish there was more of that. Because after a while, all this just kind of becomes reused, repeating textures and props without uh, a whole lot of significant things to, to find. And just like Shattered Memories, we can peek going through doors. We can go through doors and peek and see what's on the other side, even on gates, where we can see right through them anyway. To aim, hold left trigger. It's right trigger to throw your weapon. And that is the tutorial to learn that throwing your weapon is a terrible idea. It'll almost always go somewhere where you can never ever get it back. That's, I think, the actual purpose of that tutorial. I think it is strictly just to teach you Throwing your weapon is a terrible idea. Don't do it. You won't get it back nine times out of ten. Have you tried or not to speedrun this game? I did speedruns for every game in the series, including this one. For a while, I was like second or third place on the leaderboards. Just behind uh, Enigma and Starwin. But I didn't practice this one a whole lot, so... And a lot of other people picked it up and started running it and got pretty good at it. Like, oh my queen. So, at this point... I don't really actively speedrun any of the games anymore. Um, but I'm probably going to pick it back up and start uh, speedrunning again here in the next week or so. Now that I'm done with all the uh, story playthroughs after this one. And you can open this back up if you want to come back out and get a wrench. I feel like they're trying to kind of teach you little game concepts at this point. You know, where weapons will spawn, where you can just 
continuously go and pick them up, the door peeking mechanics, interacting with stuff in the environment like the radio, um, picking up the map. So, and then opening up these kind of like shortcuts that, that loop back to places where you've been before. There are a handful of times where this is a thing throughout the game, but not nearly enough to where they should be like teaching it during this segment as like a mechanic. Do we still get frame drops here? No frame drops here. This part on like, if you're playing on an actual 360 or if you're playing on like PlayStation 3, when you uh, go through this section, oh, there's a little bit, there's a little bit of st stuttering, even on the Xbox One. The game usually hitches like crazy during this little segment where the rocks fall and block that off. Then this. We get some more interesting foreshadowing stuff in the environment here. Again, I wish they would have kept up with this throughout, like, the rest of the game. Devil's Pit Aerial Tram, free ticket for kids who beat our escape game. So we're going to be playing that escape game to get that ticket. Across the Devil's Pit. Natural Wonder filled with subterranean myths and legend. Disabled access for wheelchair users. And the wheelchair user in the poster is all scratched out. A reference to Anne Cunningham's father, Frank Coleridge, after being attacked and wheelchair bound. We're going to see Frank all throughout the game as sort of a mutilated sort of creature looking appearance in a wheelchair just uh, recurring from various times throughout the playthrough. But we get a little bit of foreshadowing to that from that poster. Free tram ticket. So where the hell's the machine? Free tickets for kids who play our game with a man's butt on it. A man's naked butt. You're not wrong. We're going to get there. In fact, you can see it right there in the poster for the game. Be free, get free ticket. Do you think this game has themes around like a prisoner being free? Anyone get that impression? Anyone feel like uh, maybe that's a thing? It's subtle. It's really subtle. But I think maybe, just maybe, they were trying to, uh... These game tokens look ancient. They were trying to have some themes in this game. What are the odds Murphy's hallucinating both the poster and the actual machine? I mean, there's an ending where all of this is just uh, a nightmare by Anne Cunningham, who is actually the prisoner, and Murphy's just a guard. Like, what are the odds that anything in this game is real in any sort of context? <laughs> Based on the, like, smattering of realities that we get for each of the endings. Devil's Pit. That aerial tram. No other place in America has a view like this. Bring cameras. The ride to the top takes 15 minutes. Take a round trip or stay longer in the observation room. Can you imagine being in one of those uh, little baskets? Little hanging sky tram baskets for 15 whole minutes? You can kind of follow the tracks here. 
where the tram ticket, the game to win the free tram ticket has been dragged through. Looks like it opens from the other side. Just to kind of lead you through, direct you as, as a player. Devil's Pit Stop. Welcome. Oh, there's the sign. Silent Hill, one mile. Highway 73. Can I get over here without triggering the cutscene? I can. Is every goddamn road in this town washed out? Am I going to show any other endings apart from the one that I'll get? Yes. Um, because it's very easy to manipulate your choices at the end of the game to get a couple of other endings. So uh, we will show at least two endings. said she's a wicked old beast. Me, I'm partial to something with a little less rust, but to each his own. Look, I don't want any trouble. Just point the way out of town, and I'll keep right on going. Now, who said anything about trouble? Just trying to be helpful, son. Name's Howard, by the way. Murphy. Heading to prison, are no, you, Murphy? Uh, just looking for a way out of town, is, is all. That's so. Afraid all the roads are out, every last one of them. Strangest thing. What the f Something wrong, son? Did you see it? it up there in the window. Hmm? Uh, never mind. I suppose if you're really desperate, you could try the old Sky Tram. Of course, it hasn't really been kept up since the accident. I'll take my chances. That's the spirit? Well, this mail ain't gonna deliver itself. Good luck, Murphy. Hope you find whatever it is you're looking for. Hey, uh, what's the name of this place? I... Well, that's Howard the Mailman. Everyone's favorite Silent Hill character. Oh, look, the downpour is starting. It finally happened. It's downpouring. But yeah, that's Howard. Howard the Mailman. His name is Howard Blackwood. He's a mailman. And he is our explanation as to what Silent Hill is in this game. In all the previous games up to this point, you know, we talk about the town itself and sort of the power around that town and what it's capable of doing. In the original games, the way that that power sort of works is relatively consistent. There's a lot of elements of it that are obviously still left very open to interpretation, very mysterious intentionally, because Team Silent never wanted to fully explain those kind of things. Shit! 
Highs for days. Thank you so much for the sub. Very much appreciate that. Thank you. But um, with those games, you had the town itself, which was settled on an area with high spiritual activity, a lot of strange, mysterious things happening because of a spiritual power in the area. And for the most part, whenever we saw it, it was capable of taking things from inside people's minds and manifesting those elements onto the reality around it. So in the case of something like Silent Hill 1, the town's power was manifesting things from Alessa's mind onto reality around her. Um, this game treats Silent Hill more kind of how it was interpreted later down the line through things like the movies and some of the things like the comic books. Again, talking about the comics, uh, we've talked about the downpour specific comic and story, but there's a whole series of Silent Hill comics outside of the games and movies and stuff that are kind of their own thing as well, um, which is actually what Howard the Mailman is from. Howard Blackwood originates from a Silent Hill comic book called Silent Hill Past Life that takes place in the 1800s. So you see this very early version of Silent Hill as a town in uh, the Silent Hill Past Life comic, and we're introduced to Howard uh, Blackwood's character and the fact that he is still here and still a postman since the 1800s is sort of your your idea of what the town is and how it's functioning in this game and how it's very different from everything else in the series. In this game, the town and the power is treated like a purgatory. Once you're here, you're stuck here unless you manage to get past, you know, your your trauma or your issues or whatever, then Reality keeps continually bending in order to make you sort of haunt Silent Hill. Um, but yeah, Howard's backstory is he was originally a slave in, uh, in Silent Hill past life in the 1800s, who was used to track down other runaway slaves who then turned on his slave master and murdered him. And that's why, that's what he did in his past. Leading up to the events of Silent Hill Past Life, where he is the postman for Silent Hill. And because of that, he is just still here. He's just still here, still as the postman hundreds of years later. Did I read all those comics? Most of them. There's still, I think, one or two that I haven't read. Um, but yeah, I own uh, quite a few of them. Where I just bought uh, physical copies of a lot of the comics, including the end story comic. You can't undo anything you've already done, but you can face up to it. Must have hit my head pretty damn hard in the crash. So we get these little audio clips occasionally throughout the game. I wish there was a, a tad more of that and not quite so unsubtle with what they actually say. But uh, those are little clips of Officer Coolridge and Cunningham's father the creature man in a wheelchair that we see showing up throughout the game and sort of one of the major plot points of the game we've got him popping up little audio clips and occasionally little flashbacks and video clips kind of giving some insight into uh, what Murphy did times in the past that he's given Murphy advice that seems much more relevant now. Hello? Anyone here? 
And as said, as as the game kind of unfolds and you start to get bigger ideas of what's going on, I feel like a lot of the presumed plot points, and I can't even just say plot points, I have to say presumed because the way the endings are for this game, like, there is no confirmed plot for this game of what happened or what is happening one way or the other. You just have to make assumptions. <laughs> Do I own Silent Hill memorabilia? Not really. Not a whole lot. Like, I don't have any of the figures. I don't have, like, the new... They made some stuffed Robbies and uh, Lakeside Hotel keychains and amusement park keychains, things like that, recently. Um, don't really have anything like that. I've got props. I used to be a cosplayer, and uh, I had cosplayed Pyramid Head in the past. So, I've got a big prop great knife, like full-scale wooden great knife from Silent Hill 2. Um, and I've got a lot of artwork. Need pictures? I've put it on Twitter before. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to, to post some new ones. Right after we flush these toilets. But if you're willing to, like, dig through my old Twitter stuff, it should be on there. You can flush almost every toilet in the game. And you get absolutely nothing for it. Not even a lousy achievement. And... We have our notebook. So Murphy is, I guess, allowed to carry around a notebook. He's seen using this and like having it and reading things out of it in his cell in a couple of scenes. So aside from just our little tutorials and things, objectives, find a way out of the area. These objectives are like a joke. They're always the most vague, general, you know, escape Silent Hill. At one point, it literally just says escape Silent Hill. Like, no shit. That's the objective? Early residents of Devil's Pit. Do you know Native Americans used to call Silent Hill home? Arthropologists know this because of the various artifacts found here, specifically in the cave systems surrounding Devil's Pit. A number of these relics indicate ceremonies being held for the deity Kwikwaksui suggesting his importance to the people here. In fact, one of the names given to this area was Kwekwaxui Kinesda, Nest of the Ravens. Hey kids, is Silent Hill a special place to you? If you were naming this area, what would you call it? Is it? Is it a special place? Is it a special place to you, chat? Do you get it? Did you play Silent Hill 2? Did you play Silent Hill 2? It's your special place. I hate this journal. Luckily, like, I'm playing on a big enough screen and, you know, jamming my face right into it for the sake of my stream setup that I can read all of this stuff on one page. And most of the notes you can kind of, like, go through and read on one page. But there's... It's split up into these weird sections. It doesn't let you just freely scroll across it when you zoom in. You just have to, like, go left or right, top, middle, or bottom. And you can zoom in to, like, a specific section. So usually there will be, like, you see there at the bottom how the text is kind of hidden behind the button prompts because there's no way to make those go away. So you just have to, like, scroll it a little bit. It's weird. I don't know why they have it set up this way. Like, they could have given you full control of the camera when you zoom in. They've done that. Like, you have that level of control over the map in, like, the original Silent Hill game. And then, like, Silent Hill 2. Like, this is... Should be 
fairly easy to, to do, right? Where you just zoom in on something and, and scroll the camera around on it manually so that you can follow what you're reading. I don't know. It, it might just be kind of like nitpicking menu stuff, but it's a lot of little things in this game. I would say overall, the, the general main ideas and stuff, uh, elements to this game are not that bad. Like, it could have been a much better game if, like, everything that was included in Anne's story in the comic was included in this game. Um, and just if the game itself was a little bit more polished up. Because it just comes off so rough. There's so many little things that are just kind of annoying and not quite right. It's not like one What's that? big overall major element yes. that's wrong with the game. It's a lot of kind of small things that add up. I'm just gonna stay I'm just gonna stay right here. Get a nice Ah, some nice deep breaths in front of this gas. I mean, as long as there's no fire, I think, uh, I think it'll be fine. We can just enjoy the gas. The idea of exploring a prisoner's mind is full of potential. I agree, Cackling Hieroglyph. I, uh... I think they could have done a lot with that concept of, like, somebody who was guilty of something and their reasoning of doing it. Like, again, if if all the endings and everything from this game was a little bit more cohesive, concurrent, um, to where Murphy was, like, always guilty of killing... Patrick Napier, that would have fixed a lot of the issues that I have with this game. At least as far as its story. Oh, shit! Fire! Anyone hear me? Fire! Don't worry, I'm sure it's fine. Murphy is from Anne's mind. Maybe. Maybe. Like, I can't even... Anything that you say about this game, as far as, like, who's real, who's not, how much of it is, is fact, or how much of it is canon or not canon... There's evidence to support and contradict just about any theory you can try to have with this game. And that's kind of my problem with it. Like, it's neither here nor there. You can absolutely just kind of say anything and just be like, yeah, sure, maybe. Maybe it's all a nightmare that Officer Sewell is having. Maybe none of these people are real. That's, that's an absolute legitimate theory. And there's not really anything to disprove it. <laughs> so let's explain health bars. In previous Silent Hill games, you could like open up your menu and see how much damage you've taken. You have like a little colored box blinking on the screen on the menu, letting you know how damaged you are. In some cases, you would even have like an on-screen health indicator. In Downpour, you get bloody clothes. The more hurt you are, the more bloody your clothes are. So you can just look at Murphy's back and how bloody he is, and eventually his face and everything else. And then uh, he just has Wolverine, you know, healing powers whenever you use a first aid kit, a common first aid kit, good for treating basic cuts, burns, and other minor injuries. We can treat our burns and clean our clothes. Honestly, I kind of like it. 
I like the idea of having the, the on-screen health indicator just be the character model. It's a little bit weird if you really think about like what's going on with the, the clothes just getting clean and the wounds just sort of like healing right in front of you like that, but the idea of keeping everything sort of on screen is fine. Except they also do give you the option of just looking at your health if you're willing to dig through menus. These are menus that I think most people who play this game, even not casually, like more than once, will see menus in this game that they didn't even know existed. Because I don't know how many people in, who've gone through and played Downpour ever paused and looked up the statistics during their playthrough to track how much health they have or how much progress through the game they've made or how many side quests they've completed. You did? I imagine some people did. I'm not saying absolutely nobody did. But I know a lot of people who played this game quite a lot that didn't know, like, what all was in here in the statistics menu. But yeah, you track absolutely, like, everything that you've picked up, how much time you've spent using certain things. But yeah, health status on the stat screen just kind of buried away. Oh yeah, and it doesn't scroll back to the top when you leave and go back in, so you need to scroll all the way through it if you're looking for something specific. It's even better when you're doing certain side quests and um, it tells you, like, you found a Silent Hill artifact. That's one of the things in this game, one of the side, facts, uh, side quests is going through and collecting all of these uh, hidden artifacts around town, which is uh, something that you do for one of the extra endings, the surprise ending. And uh, it tells you to like go look in a specific menu to look at those artifacts. That menu is not a menu that you can access from here. You have to completely exit the game and go all the way back to the like main title screen. And that series of menus lets you look at the artifacts and things that you, like, picked up throughout the game. So, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll eventually get to that, because even if I don't do that whole side quest, I will probably dig at least one of those up. Alright, I guess we're done hotboxing this kitchen. Let's go. Water touch the breaker box. Okay. So what do we think? Visually, what does everybody think about that transition to the other world? Because this is one of those things that's totally subjective. Honestly, I don't think it's great, personally. I don't think the other world is distinct enough, and I feel like um, it's Homecoming's effect, but worse. Like, Homecoming was at least doing the, the effect from the movie, with reality sort of peeling away and revealing the other world underneath it. So... Yeah, whatever, it's copying the movie, but at least it faithfully copied the movie. It's a decent-looking effect in the game when it does happen. Um, 
This one, it's kind of that same effect, but instead of reality peeling away, it does that little shiny white glimmer. And I can't help it. Maybe my this completely skews my perception of it. But I can't help it because for anybody who's watched Twin Perfect and the real Silent Hill experience on YouTube, they refer to it as Disney magic. And I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Disney movies, a lot of big Disney movies. And the ending of Beauty and the Beast, the Disney original Beauty and the Beast, when everything is turning back to, like, the good castle... And everyone in the castle is, like, turning back to human. And it's, like, that rippling, shiny white effect. Just sort of washing over everything and revealing, like, the good castle underneath. It it really seriously looks just like that. And I can't help but think about that every single time I see it now. So thanks, Twin Perfect. Thanks, Fungo. That's probably Fungo's joke. Because anytime I see the other world effect, I'm just like, yeah, Disney magic. Some pretty decent audio and stuff, I will say. The sound of the rushing water, but then, like, the overall, like, breathing effect. Notice the camera is breathing, too. Like, it's not just the breathing audio that you hear they sort of have the camera shifting in and out as well and they don't constantly do that there's there's times where they sort of skew your camera view during these segments and have that pulsing sort of rhythm to them and other times where it's a lot more still and static So I mean, they they were they were trying, they were going for things. Oh my god, that looks just like my rug. But faded. Oh god, this is the real nightmare right here. Flies in the house and the AC's not working. I have been there. I have been there before. I don't know. I feel like stuff like this is a little bit too sudden in the game. Like, we're in the first running segment, and it already feels like they're trying to kind of emulate nowhere from the end of most Silent Hill games. Where they're taking all these significant places and sort of uh, throwing them all together with no real rhyme or reason. This is Anne's Nightmare, A Broken Home. That's a good interpretation, Dr. Grimm. It would be nice if we got more implication to that in the game itself outside of, like, information in the comic books, but yeah. And that really is kind of the idea. Um, a few people were talking about that in chat as well how you're sort of looking at as far as a villain they refer to him as the boogeyman and it's really a story about pers you know perspective where to murphy the man who killed his son charlie napier was his boogeyman and to Anne Cunningham, the man who 
essentially killed her father, Murphy Pendleton, as far as she knows, was her boogeyman. So it's all about perspective, where us, from our perspective as Murphy, the more that we learn about what happened, the more we sort of see Patrick Napier as the villain that Murphy did. But we have to learn more about why Anne Cunningham sees Murphy that way. And I mean, we get we get that conclusion. We get that idea of what happens at the very, very end. But there's so much stuff that's covered in the Anne story comic that we just don't get. No, I don't have the comic book in hand. This is the first puzzle. Rotate the painting and run. I'm just trying to get a decent look at the bed because there's uh, a figure on the bed. It's a body like wrapped in a bag. Later on, we see Murphy flashing back to the time where they found his son, Charlie, because they pull him up out of the lake. Uh, the police are pulling his body out of the lake and up onto a boat. We saw the boat that he was in, or that they pull him up into, um, at the very start by the bus crash. One of the places that I stopped and looked around at, there was that boat sitting on the, uh, the shore. And then now we're seeing Charlie's body in that bag strapped onto the bed. So we're literally running right past Charlie doing this puzzle and getting into this area. The fact that he's uh, strapped down to the bed also supposed to be probably that implication of sexual abuse to Charlie from uh, Napier. Run. So after we have that nice bit of symbolism, let's, uh, oh, you can't pause while looking behind you. It forces you to look forward when you hit pause. I didn't know that. So anyone want to take a guess as to what this is after talking about some nice little bits of symbolism and stuff? Because then we've got a running segment. It's basically like Silent Hill Shattered Memories where we're going through uh, these segments where we're, we're just running away. We have to run away. All, all we can do is run. We're being pursued by something we cannot fight. And it's the Silent Hill 3 segment uh, at the end of Borley's Haunted Mansion where you've got just the red wall of death following behind you. loop his ass. Yeah, it's time for those DBD skills. Here, eat a basket with a thing in it. Have another one. Here, it's always the third gate that you look at that opens. You can get a shorter route through by opening this gate and running right at it. That's uh, Anne Cunningham's bedroom. That we get a glimpse of there that we're running past. So it is this sort of mashup. Jesus, stop with the screaming. But uh, so we're sort of seeing this mishmash of Anne Cunningham's memories and sort of nightmares mashed together with Murphy's memories and nightmares. Uh, we're seeing bits of that scrambled together already in this first running segment. And it's so hard to get a look at anything that's going on through there. Ah! 
They force you to just like run past so many so, so much stuff so quickly. Hey, there's the bus. Remember the bus? The water slide segments. Oh, did you see the Disney magic? What is this place? Yeah, the water slide portions feel a little bit weird and out of place still. And, um, I mean, I used to rag on this segment of the game and give it shit because there's a lot of other games that have done this sort of visual style by the time this game came out. But compared to everything else in this game, this is at least like trying to, to do something. They're doing something a little more interesting visually. Ultimately, like, I wish we would have gotten more stuff where they were at least like kind of trying for a little more interesting visual for your, uh, your environments. Yep. Subtle video game themes. There was a thing a while back. I can't remember what it was for. It was it was like a a political campaign or something. Where there's a there's footage of like a senator or a governor, somebody singing Born Free. Like, really, really badly. And at some point, I meant... I was gonna make, like, a, a sound bite or something of it. I just was lazy and never did it. Yep. Born Free. Is this DMCAA friendly? Oh, no. Not at all. I'm sure even if uh, this gets re-uploaded to YouTube, Dorian's going to have a hell of a time uploading it because Born Free plays throughout this game. Lots of licensed music plays throughout this game. Um, and it's almost always immediately flagged on YouTube. The intro music is almost immediately flagged on like everything. So this will be archived. It'll it'll be archived just the same as it always has, but uh, on Twitch that audio will most likely be muted. And uh, yeah, I said Dorian might not bother re-uploading this to YouTube. And if he did, he probably put in a lot of effort removing licensed music or editing around it. So. Props if you want to go through that much effort. And uh, shoutouts to Dorian House, who does all the YouTube re-uploads. A few people in chat said that they were here from uh, YouTube. First time seeing the stream live. So welcome anybody who's here live for the first time. And anybody who watches on YouTube. I don't do any of my own YouTube stuff. I had my own channel very shortly, and it's just too much of a pain in the ass to uh, to do uploads and stuff to YouTube, mostly because of DMCA stuff. So Dorian handles doing all the re-uploads. He's the only one who's asked my permission to re-upload any of my videos and stuff onto, uh, onto YouTube. Yeah, there's a link to it in chat. Thank you, Queen. So, Dorian's the only one who's asked me for any sort of permission um, to go through and, and re-upload stuff. And he usually edits them and takes out, like, my breaks and things like that. Good thing I'm watching this in person instead of the VOD this time. Oh, yeah. That's why you never want to miss the live stream, even with the archives. 
especially for games like this. You, you miss out on a lot of stuff just because, uh, yeah, DMCA ruins shit. Now more than it ever has. All right, Ducky. Have a good night, dude. Take it easy, man. Gotta run from the butthole of death again. How does everybody feel about Murphy screaming? I know that's one thing that a lot of people have complained about with the past Silent Hill games where protagonists, like, don't really react to stuff. Whereas in this, Murphy's fucking screaming his head off. And then they hit you with that endless stairway. And you can see we did take quite a bit of damage from that running segment and everything. We can completely pause the game and break our immersion to go to this game statistics page in the statistics menu and check that our health is at 56%. And your health actually will automatically regenerate back up to, I think, at least 50%. If you ever manage to get lower than uh, half health. You have to go to the stats menu for your health. You, otherwise, you just have to look at his clothes and see how bloody they are. You can also kind of tell by Murphy's walk. He'll change his walk animation and run animation based on how injured he is. So, uh, that's one of those things that you actually have to somewhat mediate in the speed run for this game. You need to make sure that you've got enough health to mitigate times where the game is basi basically going to guarantee damage you. And, uh, make sure that Murphy is healed enough so that he'll be running fast enough to get through, like, certain segments optimally. Or toilet flushing. We might not get a reward for it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Can't quite read the names on the books. And like almost see this one. I'm trying to get the camera down closer to it. Making master guitars. And guitar making is the white one a few over from it. Interesting. I don't think I ever noticed any of the book titles on the textures and stuff. Somebody's really into guitars. They definitely don't have any around. Uh, 
sound of somebody locking the door. Locked. As we head up here. Lots of little optional side things to do in this game. Lots of ways to break gravity by climbing around on objects. Like that. There are actually a few places in this game where you can uh, go out of bounds. Like climbing up onto boxes and stuff. But none of it is useful for speedruns in like any capacity. All it does is soft lock the game. Get a good look at all these uh, wallpapers, textures, uh, painting textures, these little light fixtures, these bookshelves. I'm trying to get a decent look at all the details and stuff on them now. Oh, hey, a book about Silent Hill. Because, uh, yeah, they're going to be repeated over and over and over throughout the game. We're not going to have much to uh, want to spend time looking around at once we're exploring and stuff later. This one dirty smudge pattern on the window. They could only afford one window. Here, I'll take a frying pan. Actually, give me that knife. At least this game doesn't try to retcon. True, Dr. Grimm. Which is why I still uh, put it a little bit above, like, Origins. Get a look at this room. We're going to be in here a little bit. But I want to look at it. Before the scene here happens. Artificial respiration. Performing CPR. Is definitely not what is happening in here later. Will I be doing side quests? Uh, n probably some. But no, this won't be like all side quests. This won't be 100%. But I'm not just going to be rushing through and, like, speed running through it either. We're still going to be walking around like this, trying to take our time through uh, looking at stuff. Doing a few of the side quests along the way. Because there are some that are kind of interesting. Looks like a way out. Um, specifically the movie theater one. I wish more of them were like that, where they have a little bit more relevance to the uh, to the main plot points, the main story, because a lot of them are just kind of unrelated. But if more of them gave like more actual like story, more lore, even if it's just a little bit of like world building and kind of backstory stuff. then uh, I would have preferred that. Whereas a lot of them are just kind of like, here's just a random spot in the town. Solve a puzzle. Do a thing. It's not really explained. It's just like a spooky thing. Busted. And you solve the puzzle to the spooky thing and get, you know, a health pack and some bullets. All right, so the panel's busted. Find something to fix it. Ooh, the game is itching really bad. 
So that is just how this game runs, by the way. That's not like an issue if it looks weird on the capture or anything like that. Uh, even when you're running this game on the best possible version, best possible hardware, it, uh, it stutters and lags. It's got issues. It's not nearly as bad as it is on if you're playing it on like uh, PS3 or something. Somebody also asked earlier if there was a PC version of this. There is not. But um, PlayStation 3 emulation has gotten to a point where apparently you can emulate this game and uh, it works pretty decently now. So officially there is no PC version. Let's talk for a moment about what's happening right now. You can only carry one thing at a time, like, as far as weapons. So I can't just, like, have a weapon for smashing locks and then, like, switch to it when I need it. Like, uh, like in Homecoming, for example. So I need to pick up that wrench. But the game is, like, sort of context sensitive. So I try to pick up the wrench and I already have a weapon in my hand. So the game dropped my knife. But it dropped my knife in such a way that I couldn't pick up the wrench from where I was standing. So I had to move a little bit to try and press A to pick up the wrench. And I moved a little bit and Murphy, after pressing A, picked up the knife again, which I then pressed B to throw the knife out of my hand, pressed B again, because that also puts the flashlight into your hand. For some reason, even though the way that you hold the flashlight and look around with it, is exactly the same when it's in your hand as when it's clipped on your belt anyway. So why is that even a feature? All I want to do is pick up the wrench. All I want. All I want downpour. Again, this might seem like really nitpicky, stupid little things, but when you're like, you've got a screamer fucking flailing around and slapping you on one side and a... Uh, weeping bat running after you and knocking you down and you're trying to switch weapons and you deal with all this weird context sensitive shit with how the uh, the weapon system would work and weapons can degenerate and break even guns you can break guns by hitting too many things with them which, sure, I guess adds a, some level of realism. I don't know who could possibly break, like, a fucking steel crowbar. Or a metal fire axe. Attempts to attract larger audience fail. I don't know. Like, I can understand modernizing certain aspects to it and being like, we gotta have a open world feel you got to be able to go and explore got to have side quests and stuff like that i can un i can understand that but the weird weapon mechanics and stuff like i don't know why they are so determined to make it something different when the original system that worked for like the first games was totally fine just have weapons just have different weapons and certain ones are better against different enemies. But once you pick it up, it's yours. You have it. It's just about switching to it in the situation where you need it. Piece of wire. This piece of wire can be used as a replacement in a burned out electric circuit. Also had a key from the motel behind the diner, game tokens, ticket game, or heavy utility flashlight.
Come on, do something. Do something cool. I wish there would just sometimes be something. You can flush all the toilets and interact with all these little things. I guess they kind of do some interesting stuff with the radios. Because you can run up and, like, turn radios on and off in some specific areas. And um, occasionally you'll start getting dialogue. There's extra little bits of dialogue on the radio where you'll, he you'll hear other characters' voices. You'll hear Anne. You'll hear Bobby Ricks whispering stuff to you. our introduction to combat and one of the first enemies the screamer guess why they're called screamers it's like an air screamer from silent hill one but on the ground obviously See the camera and lock-on system and combat are all very, very well done and fleshed out. Here comes the Disney magic. Yeah, she's jitterbugging and stretching around. Felt like they really could have developed that prisoner, could have made him into a more compelling character. Sure. They could have originally had more planned with this guy. I forget his name. They they give the prisoners uh, names and a little bit more story in the Anne Story comic book. But, um, yeah, they could have built that up a little bit. Have this other prisoner guy kind of helping you out, but you're not sure if you can trust him. And then, yeah, I don't know. Done a little bit something else there. But it introduces the enemy. And I guess what you're supposed to feel for that enemy, the fact that Murphy approaches first, thinking it's just like an innocent woman getting beaten up by this prisoner, and then he doesn't understand. It's a it's a horrible monster that's trying to kill him, and he's defending himself. Which I guess you could say is technically saying something about this game's theme of perspective. How, like... Murphy doesn't think of himself as too bad of a person. Well, he kind of does, but... He doesn't see himself as a monster the way Anne sees him. And then he views people like Patrick Napier, the guy who kidnapped and killed his son. He sees him as the monster. So it's all kind of about the perspective of who you see as your... Your personal antagonist, who a monster would be in your eyes. So they kind of display that, I guess, through the screamer. Also, instant fog. Isn't that a great effect? Turn the fog machine back on. Back outside. Oh my 
god, and the game's still, even on the Xbox One, stuttering. Just trying to load this next area while also saving the game. Meat cleaver, sure. What's in the fridge? Beer bottles. Oh, is that not one that you can actually pick up? Damn, your bathroom sucks. Where's the toilet? Where's the toilet? Quattro is an American? True. This is not like an American studio. It had a lot of American staff on it. Um, but Vatra, as far as the devs themselves, were based, uh, I think, out of Czech. Or I think it's a Czech dev team. It's definitely no Team Silent. Hasn't been Team Silent since 2004. So, gotta get past that, Dr. Grimm. Definitely get it. Wish it wasn't the case, but it, it has been that way for quite some time. That's on Konami. Even without Konami intervening and interfering, like people, members of Team Silent were already moving on to other projects, different positions at different companies, even outside of uh, Konami disbanding. Not saying that Konami didn't play a part in that. They absolutely did, but that's something fans got to realize is like Team Silent would not have been together forever I don't think under any circumstances. It definitely was not like the best way that it could have handled, you know, the best way that Konami could have handled it and treated them for that matter. But yeah, eventually, even if they would have still called it Team Silent, a lot of key members would have probably left or uh, new people would have gotten promotions and had more control over the game. Like, in the first game, a lot of the reason for the first game being the way that it was was because of, you know, Hiroyuki Owaku being the main writer, scenario writer, and um, Takeyoshi Sato doing the, the CG and the visuals, Masahiro Ito's artwork. Um... But then when you moved on to like Silent Hill 2, Takeyoshi Sato had way more influence and way more control on that project than he did for Silent Hill 1. So even if Team Silent would have kept going, different people would have had more influence, you know, among the team members. Wonder where the breaker is. I don't know. So so many fans think that, oh, if, if Team Silent would have just stayed together or if you just got Team Silent back together now that it would just instantly start producing good Silent Hill games again. And I don't I just don't think that's realistic. I don't think that's the case. I think it if a lot of core members of Team Silent would have still been involved with the projects, I think there's a good chance they probably would have been better than what we did get. But hey, alternate universes and worlds all speculation reality is team disbanded and they started outsourcing different dev teams from game to game after four so everybody on those dev teams kind of had their own ideas their own takes on what silent hill was and like what to what to make of it
So normally, you'll get an enemy spawn here. Ooh, I'm dropping frames. What the hell? The frame drop enemy. Now, normally you'll get an enemy spawn here. Uh, when you're walking away after turning on the generator. But the trigger for that enemy spawning is picking up the new clothes. So if you go and do the generator first and then come over here and pick up the clothes, you skip that enemy encounter. Because it'll spawn a screamer just directly behind you and immediately, like, you, you just have to, like, start fighting it off. Does an HD collection have lag spikes? The lag spikes in this are super noticeable. They're pretty bad in HD collection too, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty bad. And that said, I'm playing on an Xbox One. This is about as smooth as Downpour can get um, in any official capacity. And it still has uh, still has a lot of issues. Some of the paintings are the uh, screamer enemies. They themselves are all like clawed up. All right. Clean clothes. Story nice. relevant clothes. Huh? It immediately becomes soaked What's with this? blood because our health is low. time since I had real clothes. So you do have to pick up these clothes. They've got a key that you need and some important key items that you're going to need. A police badge found in the pocket of some discarded clothes. This police badge belongs to uh, Officer Frank Coleridge and Cunningham's father. So when she sees it, she's going to very reasonably react. And a uh, rusty key, an old rusty key that we need to open up the gate, get back out of this area into the front of the diner. But we've got our game tokens. We've got some clean clothes. And if you want to, if you prefer the uh, prison outfit for Murphy, you can totally just switch back to it. You can absolutely just switch back to it right there. I will say, listen to the music here. Listen to that, like, bit crush synth sound. The ambient, like, tones and that, that bit crush synth sound reminds me a lot of like the old Friday the 13th like a Harry uh, Manfredini track Miss Murphy's outfit is the one in the city anyway yeah we do get a few different outfits if you do uh, some side quest stuff you can get uh, an alternate outfit for Murphy but let's do the the new clothes so that the cutscene with Anne makes sense Later on, Anne is going to be like, where did you get this when she finds the police badge? And Murphy's like, I just found it in these clothes. But if you switch back to the prison clothes, he's like, he's trying to tell her that, hey, it's not my fault. It was just in these clothes, in this prison uniform that I've been wearing the whole time. That. do Hemingway lights you can tell by the uh, color and the design on the packaging that's the Hemingway light fake brand of cigarettes in the western Silent Hill universe they started showing those in Silent Hill Origins first western Silent Hill game and they, they show them in every other main Western game. They're in Homecoming. Oh, did you see that? Did you see that shadow moving across? It's 
so spooky. Can I still get the, uh... The enemy encounter here. Oh my god, she spawned out of nowhere! Yeah, you do. Ghost of smoke's gone by. How are these games perceived in Japan? Uh, that's a great question. I don't really know. For the most part, uh, I, I don't know how Japanese reception was overall on the game. I mean, in general, the Western games were not huge sellers compared to, like, Resident Evil or anything by any stretch of the imagination. Homecoming wasn't even released in Japan, right? Right. Homecoming wasn't released in Japan, so that one they didn't even bother releasing over there. Um... Downpour did get a Japanese release, and they got better box art. Japan always gets the better box art. And do you know who did the, the box art for Silent Hill Downpour for the Japanese release? They got Masahiro Ito. Why didn't they just get him to do the monster design? It would have been better. Yeah. Yeah. They get Ito for one thing for Downpour, and it's just to make the Japanese box art cover. Let me, um, let me pull it up. Or Japanese box art. I am pulling it up. Look at that. So that's the uh, that's the Silent Hill downpour Japanese box art that Masahiro Ito did. Way better. Way better. False advertising? I mean, yeah. If there was anything in the game that looked even remotely that cool. Can we take a look at the EU one and compare that to the US version? Is there a difference between the EU and uh, North American versions? Let me check. Oh, there is. Sorry, give me a second. Trying to save these and uh, get them to where I can bring them up here.
So that's the Japanese box art that Ito did uh, on screen right now. Here is the... God, that's way too big. Here is the uh, European box art. So it's got like the leather straps on the side. Howard the mailman in spooky green light. Yeah, got Howard on the cover. And uh, North American cover. Which is just Murphy. Just Murphy clutching an axe. In spooky grayscale. And they at least sort of emphasize the rain effect. So generic. It is very generic. It reminds me of the... Um, it reminds me of box art for a lot of other games. But specifically... This looks to me like a uh, like Quantic Dreams box art. This looks like the um, Indigo Prophecy box art, <laughs> or something like that. Definitely not as good as as the Ito art. Of course, they get Ito for one fucking thing, and it's the Japanese box art. Okay, had to take a moment. Bring that up. Let's, uh... Oh my god, the link broke, queen. That's supposed to be the Indigo Prophecy art. I don't think the link worked correctly. We're gonna jailbreak. Because... Subtle visual imagery symbolizes Murphy and escaping from prison. Um, because we're playing on hard mode, it does change this quote-unquote puzzle a little bit. So there's more places for the, for the ball to get stuck. There's more holes compared to if you're playing on easy. And they cover up his butt. They put a hole right there for one of the balls. You can lose your ball in his butt. Just what everyone wanted. Is this a pachinko machine? Worse. How are you moving the ball? That is a great question. Magnets, maybe? Question mark? I think it's supposed to be like one of those games where it uses air pressure, where you like, um, you push like a button and make, uh, the water, like a squirt of air into the water to push things. There used to be like kids toys and things like that. Um, I could kind of see a, something being something like that, but you don't see anything moving the water like that. The ball is just moving. If it's magnets, why do you need the water? Yeah. Good question. Because the game is called Downpour. And they were trying desperately to think of clever yes. ways to work in water. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about, like, the water theme and symbolism of this game. Like, yes, you've got the rain itself sort of replacing your other world effects. You've got a little bit more focus on it in that regard. 
And I guess the whole idea is just because Charlie himself was drowned that he was thrown into the lake. That they theme so much of this around water. alone so it might seem based on that little segment where Murphy was running that he has like stamina because he kind of sprinted and then slowed down but basically the short way of describing it Murphy runs when he wants to this game is so fucking weird with its movement. So, first of all, not only is it just an analog game where you could just be running by holding the analog stick all the way up and then you would walk by just pressing the analog stick up slightly. You're already holding a button to run, but you're not even guaranteeing how fast Murphy's gonna be running because it depends on his health, it depends on if there's enemies nearby, um, it depends if it's just an area of the game where they programmed to make it to where you can't run. It's just you. Because there's spots in the game where you're just not allowed to run. And you never really know. You never really know what's going to happen when you hit R1. Like, how much Murphy's going to actually move. Shit! Fuck. What's up, Blad? Thank you so much for the 46 months. Is that what you say when you see your friend? That is usually how I react to seeing my friends. Screaming, fuck! This must be the ticket machine. That line delivery. Murphy just ate a fistful of Benadryl. This must be the ticket machine. This thing goes. Can't be worse than back there, can it? We're gonna explain who fuck is a little bit later. We have an old friend. An old friend of ours in Downpour. And anytime we play this game, it's like going and seeing an old friend. We call him by name, just like Murphy does. Back to work after vacation. Would have preferred another week, but got some rest and reset your brain at least. Hell yeah. That's the most you can hope for. I'm doing pretty good. We're chilling. We're enjoying the night. We're taking our time. We're going through downpour. Honestly, I'm fine with it. I'm not a big fan of this game, but it helps having not played this for like the last two years almost. So coming back to this game after a long time of not playing it, it's not so bad. This game really fucking wears on your patience when you play it all the time. Like when I was speedrunning it, and when I was doing story playthroughs a lot more frequently back in the day. There's a lot of little issues with this game that just, like, they wear on your nerves. You're just constantly like, oh my god, why are you stuck on this thing? Why is the game lagging here? Why is it like this? You have to focus on all these fucking things so much more often when you're playing the game a lot. I guess that's the one saving grace. Yeah, you get some breaks because the fucking unskippable cutscenes give you plenty of time. That's why home pour is a thing. I think Starwin is still the only one who's done it. 
I think Ekdysis might have done it or is planning to do it. Where the cutscenes... The speed run for Homecoming is so fast and you have so much time during unskippable cutscenes in Silent Hill Downpour that you can do multiple full runs of Silent Hill Homecoming during the unskippable cutscenes of Downpour. So you can do runs of both games simultaneously. You just you run Downpour and then when you get to unskippable cutscenes you you play Homecoming and you can do full fucking playthroughs of Homecoming during just the unskippable segments of Downpour. Anybody in here? Hello? Oh, uh, SH Mumbler did it. He did it the first time last week, kept forgetting to switch, but he still managed to get two runs of Homecoming within Downpour. Even forgetting and still got two full runs. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, some more foreshadowing here. To one of the characters we're about to meet, J.P. Sater. We saw a newspaper referencing J.P. Sater uh, at the very beginning of the game, the gas station right after Anne falls. Um, so we're coming up on meeting him. We see his, uh, his office here. Somebody marked out his name in red paint or blood. He was the train conductor. So I think these are other characters who were sort of stuck here, similar to Howard Blackwood. And they explain them in a little bit more detail in uh, in the Anne story comic. How they kind of reference having been stuck here and they don't even realize uh, how long they've been here in some cases, like with uh, Bobby Ricks. But uh, we sort of get a little bit more backstory for J.P. Sater. This game at least gives enough backstory for J.P. Sater. It, it gives a little bit more in the comic books, but it explains a decent amount. Whereas other characters like Bobby Ricks, we don't know like anything about Bobby Ricks from what it tells us in the game. Like very, very little. And we get a decent more bit of backstory for him uh, through the Anne story comic. Zero four eight six three. Oh no! Wait, that's a better game, and that's a playable teaser, not even a demo. You can almost hear what it's saying there. And then you do get to hear it pretty clearly there. Um, what is that from? That's a quote from something. Alone, alone, all alone on the open sea. Quote by Coleridge Samuel Taylor. The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Coleridge? Like Officer Frank Coleridge? 
So the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. Learn from yesterday, live for today, and hope for tomorrow. And there, if you touch it one more time, it blows up in your face and we get some more audio from Frank Coleridge himself. So first, in the static, we hear a quote from a writer named Coleridge. In the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And then we get a little flashback audio clip from Frank. Sounds like dad's advice to daughter. So sometimes we're hearing stuff that Frank said to Murphy, advice, ad advice, advice that Murphy has gotten uh, from Frank Coleridge. But in other instances, I think we are hearing it more from Anne's perspective, things that he would have told her just as a father. And often there was probably stuff that was both. There were probably things that he said to Anne, you know, as a father, that he also said just to people in general. Because Anne describes him as, you know, like he cared about all of the prisoners. So a lot of times he gave them advice. And very likely a lot of the stuff, a lot of the advice he would have given to those inmates, people that he cared about, Could have been the same stuff that he would have uh, told Anne. Or Murphy doesn't exist. Or none of them exist. And it's all in oh. Anne's head. Or it was all a dream that Murphy was ha having before his execution. Or... <laughs> yeah. It's all nonsense. That's the problem. Is it all falls apart at the end. It's almost a cool narrative. They just... There's no continuity to make it nice, make it a good, thorough overall story. Dark Fantasy, thank you so much for the 46 months. Very much appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Can we talk for a minute about the soap dish? Why is it way over there? Look where the sink is. Look at where the soap dish is. way too far away. Who designed this bathroom? Got the lighter. A lot of uh, items in this game are totally optional. Um, you do have like your flashlight throughout most of the game. There's optional UV lights that you can pick up. Uh, that are kind of used for some puzzles and stuff later on. There's um, radios. There are little walkie-talkies and radios that you can pick up that kind of serve the same effect as uh, the traditional radio in Silent Hill games where static will emit whenever there's enemies nearby. Hey, DJ Bobby Ricks. Yay, licensed music, my favorite. Thanks, Bobby. Didn't take much to knock this down. <laughs> DJ Ricks is your favorite character. I like him as a character. I wish they would have actually, like, said a lot more for him. Like, 
given a bit more of his backstory. Kept hearing that spooky banging sound coming from in here. Just the boarded up window. shock me I could have sworn there was one of these things here that can shock me oh well so many things about CPR stuck around in the environment I wonder if these are things, if it's meant to be something from Murphy's, you know, sort of memories. Because Charlie would have drowned, that he would have had CPR on the mind to some degree. But he gets there so late, like, Charlie's already dead. But maybe if he would have thought, like, oh, if I could have got to him sooner, if the police had got to him sooner, if they had done CPR... Maybe that's something. Maybe I'm thinking way too hard about it, trying to piece things together in this nonsense plot game. Because I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be, like, fair and analytical, even though I don't like this one. But there is a lot of stuff in this game that is just kind of... Unfortunately, like, feels like nonsense. I think it's just unfortunately a result of either being poorly written or having a lot more important plot elements that they couldn't work into the final game by the time it was released. Maybe they had longer segments, more backstory to Anne. Tom Hewlett confirmed himself on Twitter that there was a lot of content that they didn't get to put into the game, that there's little assets and elements that are in the game files. There was boss fights and stuff that were cut. Um, there was segments with Anne being playable that were cut. All of these kind of things. So there might have been a lot more to it at some point. We know there was at least some more to it. I don't know how much that would have overall helped it. Pretty impressive, ain't it? You might not guess by looking at it, but this place used to be filled with all kinds of visitors. Moms and dads and little kids and... Yeah, it was a really nice place. I'm sorry. It... You are? Name's JP, and that, sir, is the Devil's Pit. 490 meters straight down to the blackest soul of the earth. The deepest limestone sinkhole look, look, north that's of... that's fascinating, but... <sighs> Sorry. Someone, something, tried to kill me back there. You haven't seen anyone? I'm strange wandering around here, have you? First time visitor, huh? Listen, if there's a quick way out of here, I'd really appreciate it if you if you just tell me. Way out? What good would that do? Sorry. 
We, uh, don't get too many visitors these days. Right. Well, be seen. Uh, if you, if you head through the cavern, there's a train. Can take you to Hillside. Boy, I tell you, all the kids, they, uh, just love that little train. How about you show me? Sorry. Some place I gotta be. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. Hey, Wixford, good morning. The Devil's Pit. Sounds like a fun place to bring the family. The Devil's Pit. The deepest limestone sinkhole north of something. JP just kind of trails off. And that is JP. So we've seen the newspaper at the very beginning talking about, you know, is JP Sater a murderer? We found his office where somebody had marked across his name with red ink or blood. And now uh, we meet the man himself, J.P. Sater. He was the train conductor for an amusement ride here in the Devil's Pit that uh, took children from one end of the mine to the other. And uh, J.P. was a drinker. That's he was a hell of a drink. drunk on the job. And caused a crash with the train where many of the children did not survive. Ugh, I don't have any change. Oh, I do have change. We're just not going to look through it just yet. But uh, they give, again, a little bit more in the end story comic book. As we see Anne going through the Devil's Pit mine as well. And she sees JP, gets in the mine car with him, and sees the ghosts of children uh, who died on the train because of JP's sort of drinking. So, very similar to like Howard Blackwood, JP is stuck here trapped in Silent Hill Purgatory. Hey, Guggy. It's fine. I try to answer questions when I can. Um, is this even located in Silent Hill? I mean, yes. Technically, right now, we're on the outskirts of town, and we're making our way into town. Uh, but we need to get through the Devil's Pit and the mines and stuff here on the outskirts to get there. But even once we're in the actual town, it's designed completely differently. It looks and acts completely differently. It's not like it is in any of the other iterations of Silent Hill. It is very distinctly its own thing. Prisoner hanging from the edge of the bridge. A spooky hand in the uh, sky tram cart. Just some extra, like, creepy imagery that they give you here. References to the other prisoners dying that we kind of see through the, uh, the corpse hanging. And we'll see something a little bit more relevant on one of the other uh, telescopes that we can interact with later. Got anything else for me, JP? Hey, where'd you say that train is again? Told you. Just head on down to the cab. You'll find that train. Thanks. You still here? Uh... If you don't mind, I uh, kind of need some time to myself. Sure do appreciate it. Sure. Whatever. But I like your friendship and company, JP. Yep. Like I said, that train will take you right down to Hillside, and you can be on your way. So, uh, go on now. Oh, 
I see. You're scared to go down there alone, ain't you? Nothing to be ashamed of. Plenty of people get spooked down there. Even grown men like you and me. Yeah, it's fine. If the game is too scary and you don't want to proceed, JP understands. If I was you, I'd go catch that train before the sun goes down. You, uh, you don't want to be out here after dark. You can wait here all you want, but I can promise you, the scenery ain't gonna change much. Seems like nothing in this place ever changed. There's a lot of dialogue. Go on now, I told you the way out. Nothing more I can do for you. Oh my god, that box fell over. Everything's haunted. Can you attack him? It doesn't do anything. And no, you can't even swing when you're facing him. Nope. You can swing just out of range. But yeah, it's not like it does anything. See, there's some more dialogue with JP that uh, you should be able to get here. Maybe if I move far enough away and come back. Because I thought he would end on like a looping bit of dialogue where he keeps saying, oh, it's you. Maybe not. information and kind of showing where you are you go through these caves the supply cave the cave of tears and where the train station is and uh, where it leads to Silent Hill hillside No smoking, climbing, pets, eating, drinking beyond this point. And see one of the prisoner bodies getting drug away. There is a screamer over there. Once you get too close. And they try to set up a bunch of jump scares throughout this game, because of course they do. So, they have this boarded up door. Oh my god! Look at that fucking magnetic cling! time events. Disney magic away. Hey, rotting pizza. Never seen this game before. Real lack of atmosphere. Maybe maybe it's the music. Yeah. I, I pointed it out at the beginning. There was like um, that intro scene with the uh, perp walk song 
where I'm like, hey, it's Daniel Leaked kind of trying to do like a Yamaoka style track. But we're missing a lot of that atmospheric tone that the older Silent Hill games had that Yamaoka did a lot of. Where you'd usually have those kind of like low repetitive tones or just kind of repeating ambient tones for a lot of the uh, atmosphere and tension building when you're wandering around. A lot of that is missing in this game. There are little bits and pieces of it here and there, but definitely not quite as good. It's a step down, I would say. Earth of a Landmark. Some of the Earth's oldest rocks lie at the bottom of Devil's Pit. Thousands of feet thick, the rocks are made out of sediments about 200 million, uh, 200 million years after they were formed. Colossal geologic forces lifted them up into a range of mountains that may have been up to five miles high. Eventually, the mountains eroded into a plain by millions of years of rain, wind, and frost. About one billion years ago, that plain rose into a second mountain range, and these new mountains were worn away again. Later, the entire region sank beneath an inland sea where fossils of primitive shellfish on the seabed eventually hardened to form shale. Afterwards, the region was elevated again into a high plateau, and the earlier seabed now became the surface, with the ancient rocks at the bottom. World building. A little bit of lore as to why the land is shaped this way. Of course, again, Sir Silent Hill and surrounding areas in the original games weren't weren't really like this at all. So this is all this is all pretty new. This is all stuff that's just sort of unique to uh Silent Hill Downpour, the way that this game is interpreting Silent Hill, how it sort of portrays everything. There's Frank. There's Frank Coleridge. So that's Anne Cunningham's father. We're going to keep seeing these kind of uh, recurring images of him in the wheelchair. He's referred to in this game as the wheel man. Which I just always remember as being the the catch, like title catch thing for uh, the driver series of games. The wheel man is back. My God. Get out of here, crows. Or I guess ravens. Bat's Lament Falls. The waterfall before you, the tallest in Devil's Pit, is called Bat's Lament Falls. It was named by the natives of the area after a rare species of bat indigenous to the area, known as the Weeping Bat. Weeping bats spend the entirety of their lives in Dew's Tusk Cave, located toward the bottom of the pit. The Weeping Bats were named by the natives, who observed that the bats secrete a special fluid from their eyes that deters unwanted parasites from infesting their ocular cavities. The natives believed the bats were weeping, saddened by being imprisoned in such a deep, dark chamber. Get it? Imprisonment? Symbolism for Murphy, who's a prisoner? The Weeping Bats have been known to unpredictably uh, to be unpredictably aggressive and very protective of their offspring, often attacking larger creatures that also reside in Devil's Pit. However, no attack against a human has ever been reported. 
So there is apparently an actual species within the game's world of, like, logic known as these weeping bats. Uh, like an actual type of bat. But in the context of the game, that is the enemies that we're going to be encountering in the cave systems. They're referred to as weeping bats. Let's see if I can toss this. Oh my god. What happens? <laughs> he just falls through the ground. I always gotta see. I always gotta show, like, what happens. If you get to a QTE and you fail it. I love seeing that shit in games. In Homecoming, they go out of their way to give you, like, a couple of, uh... Gruesome, like, fatality death animations and stuff. And this one, Murphy just... Yeah, that was a short scream. Just immediately cut short. Uh. Murphy just uh, dies. He just falls through the world. Shit. I don't know if that made it over or not. This time I'll do the thing. Can you soft lock by throwing a key weapon like the axe off of the cliff? No. So any situations where they put you in a spot where you absolutely have to like chop down boards there will be a spot where your axe or your needed weapon will respawn so you can always go back and, and get down. one if you manage to throw it somewhere where you can't get it come on Murphy just jump to that rock and then climb up from there we have to go through so much shit just to get right on there, just to this one little platform. Ultimately, this is where we're going. Is this door. Yep, the axe made it. It's right here. That's one of the things that you can do in the speedrun for this game. To uh, keep from having to pick up the other pickaxe, which is not as fast as the hand axe with chopping boards. Once you get inside... And just keep the hand axe, throw it over this side. But yeah, ultimately we're just trying to get to this door. We have to go through the entire fucking cave system. Just to wind up right over here. Yeah, and there's a pickaxe right here. If you don't have uh, anything for breaking down these boards and progressing. Here you go. And I'm pretty sure you can't throw it out of bounds here. Because yeah, at this point you can't go back out. And you can't reset this room. Huh. Oh, you can throw the hand axe out of bounds. What about the pickaxe? Hell yeah. There's your soft lock. So don't accidentally set the controller down or tap your right trigger.
Oh, look at this. See, they just spawn another one in. They do that for every situation. So, yeah, you can't actually softbox yourself. Not like that. Another dead prisoner. That is a lot of flies. Little optional area over here. And we'll be able to go a little bit further into it once we drain these caves. Water's too deep. Come on, it's fine. It's only like waist deep. Hey, Mado. Uh, one thing you love about Team Silent, Silent Hill games, is the use of camera work. Giving a point of view of something, watching you, and breathing with the ambient sound. You don't get that with the Western Silent Hills since they love their over-the-shoulder view. Yeah, I agree. You get it. They, they have a lot more control over the vision of the game and sort of your view of the game when the classic games, you know, there's a lot of static camera angles that are constantly changing and showing different perspectives and different things as you go. Um, but of course, with like more modern games, it's harder to do that because of the way control schemes are set up. <clears throat> That's one of the benefits to having tank controls in those old games is your control of the character never changes um, based on how the camera looks. Like, if the camera's in front of you, if it's behind you, if it's looking at you from a distance to do those cinematic shots, your control over the character stays exactly the same. In Silent Hill Downpour, if my camera is, sudden, is suddenly looking at me from a different direction, my entire movement is based on where this camera is. So if they try to do those more cinematic shots and angles, it fucks with your controls more. Um, we see that problem in Silent Hill 4, because Silent Hill 4 is the first game to not let you have tank controls as a, as a character movement option. You're always moving sort of on a 3D plane. But Silent Hill 4 still does a lot of that cinematic style, you know, camera views from different angles and stuff on top of changing up the control scheme. So unfortunately, what winds up happening is you'll get a lot of situations where you like walk into an area, the camera angle switches, your controls flip around, and because your controls flipped around, you walk out of the area, which walks you back into a different camera angle, where then your controls have to reorient again so that you can go back to walking forward. It's just, it doesn't work when you don't have tank controls to go hand in hand with um, cinematic camera views. It's real hard to make that function and play smoothly. All right. Puzzle time.
Oh, look, it's hard mode. So this is the only thing that changes with hard mode for this puzzle. Um, the configuration you have to put the water chute in to power the elevator is still the same, but they make it where you have to move each one in a specific order. Otherwise, they run into each other. They get stuck. Once to turn on the pumps, or twice to power the elevator. So first, let's have the pumps on, and we can go get to that little cave area. Gotta prop this open uh, but there's one more catch on hard mode. You have to prop the door open. completely undo it. Yeah, I have to go all the way back so that that wheel is back on. There we go. So if you're playing on like normal or easy riddle, they completely omit this part. They make this much more simplified. But yeah, for hard mode, you've got to do those in a more particular order. You can't just do them in any order. And you have to make sure to drag the box over, prop the door. Now let's turn the pumps on. Door is propped. Substitute su uh, sewer level? God, it really is. They throw the sewer level at you early in this game and it is basically just these caves. Oh my god, a screamer in the water. There's no way that's going to get up and attack me, right? <laughs> Not if I attack it first. First aid kit, pistol bullets. We kind of skipped over a segment, a little optional place in the uh, earlier area, that first little like house area where uh, you can get a pistol somewhat early in the game, which is why they're throwing pistol bullets at you already here. Okay, let's move the water thing over, power on the elevators, get out of here. There's no way the Western Silent Hill games would have been allowed to have tank controls. Can't imagine the game journalist whining now. 
you know, it's one of those things where I I grew up in an era when that was just kind of like the the normal thing to have in a lot of games was that style of control. I definitely get that we're past that now. Controllers are very different. People are used to controlling games very differently. But I don't know. There's ways that you can still make the cinematic camera angle thing work. You just have to have really good tight controls to make all that function correctly. Don't worry, he's fine. Murphy's just fine. Apparently wasn't that bad of a drop. It was enough to completely shatter the fucking elevator. <laughs> knees exploded. No, nope, knees are fine. Shirt's not even dirty. 100% health. 11% through the game. We spent 2 hours and 14 minutes and 35 seconds in the real world. 17 minutes and 41 seconds in the other world. 2 minutes and 52 seconds in journal world. 8 minutes and 9 seconds in our inventory. We haven't actually read any books. Wow, I love stats. There's some more music that sounds like it's a uh, horror movie. I said the music makes me think of Friday the 13th. I recently rewatched the entire, like, Friday the 13th series, uh, all the movies, uh, and I rewatched all of the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And uh, going back through all of that again somewhat recently, I'm realizing how much the music in this game kind of just reminds me of, like, that 80s slasher music. Get away from me! Get away from me! Leave me alone, Screamer, you dirty lady. Let's talk a little bit about the monster design, because I haven't even gotten into that, really. They're just dirty ladies. Anytime I've done these old playthroughs and speedruns and stuff, it kind of became a meme, the way we refer to them, because they're just, they're dirty ladies. They're ladies with dirt on them and long nails and pointy teeth. And you can just apply so much symbolism to them just because it's such a basic image, dirty woman is bad. It's like, oh, okay, great. Is that Murphy's wife or interpretation of his wife or Anne Cunningham or her interpretation of, you know, her mother or other women in her life? They go out of their way to show, like, her husband was having an affair in um, the Silent Hill Anne story comic book. So the sexy mannequin dolls are supposed to be relevant to Anne Cunningham being this like, you know, image of a slutty woman from her mind of like who her husband is cheating on her with. Because really everything that you're going through, all of the Silent Hill related stuff, um, the visual imagery, the creatures, it's all supposed to be more relevant to Anne than Murphy. Except in a few instances. But yeah, it's just, I don't know. When you look at it at the end of the day, as far as what it is as in terms of monster design, the screamers are fucking terrible. They're just angry, dirty ladies with long nails. Dirty woman bad. Train tour of the mines. 
In the early years of Devil's Pit, mine carts were used as a transportation tool, removing materials in and out of the pit during the mining process. The mine carts rode on steel tracks and were initially pushed and pulled by either animals or humans, later replaced by engines. Due to the precip uh, precipitous angles, inclines, and declines of the Devil's Pit tunnels, it was unavoidable that the tracks would have sharp, hazardous, and often even deadly turns, which is why we have a minecart ride for children in here now. Humans working in the mines were warned to avoid riding aboard the carts whenever possible, as the death rate for such a journey was estimated at 40%. Quite simply, this meant four out of every ten miners who hitched a ride aboard a minecart met an unfortunate end. Creepy stock children laughing. This is where we get some uh, info about JP Sater and what happened here in the Devil's Pit. God, I hate the fucking zoom on the journal. Train accident at Devil's Pit causes death of eight children by Wally Thompson, staff writer. In what Silent Hill law enforcement officials are calling an unprecedented tragedy, eight children were killed last night when the tour train in which they were riding derailed in the Devil's Pit mines. Witnesses claim that J.P. Sater, the train's operator, was visibly intoxicated at the time of the accident and that negligence on his part may have led to the derailment. The train guy was drunk, said Philip Menton, a tourist from Chicago. He was belligerent to everyone, even the kids. There was no way he should have been operating anything. We've just begun investigating this terrible accident, and it's far too soon to speculate on anything, Detective Edward Rogers told reporters this morning. Rest assured, we will utilize all available police resources and personnel to uncover the cause. The Silent Hill Tourism Authority has shut down all Devil's Pit operations indefinitely and has released the following statement. We are saddened by the horrific accident involving the tourist train at our facilities and we pledge to fully cooperate with law enforcement officials in all aspects of their investigation. So this whole thing was shut down. All the Devil's Pit operation stuff was shut down. What we're seeing is sort of like a past version of it almost because we're seeing JP here and uh, he was visibly intoxicated at the time of the accident according to the paper anyway we'll see what JP has to say about it those goddamn fucking newspaper men JP Sater that's the guy I met outside oh my god loud noises Jump scares. Spooky minor ghosts. Wow, that one fell over. I'm very scared. The loud noise that sounds like air being released out of a balloon slowly is indicating that I should be very afraid right now. Ah, giant pencils. Deus Ex, thank you for the 50 bits. You wish to ride the minecart, small human? Back in the old days, Devil's Pit minecarts were drawn by robots. Why does Murphy say that JP's the guy you saw earlier? Are we expected to be this dumb? Oh yeah, oh yeah, the game is absolutely expecting you to be dumb and not paying attention. I think more so that than just dumb. Not necessarily just assuming that the player's dumb, just assuming that the player's not paying attention. So by this point, you would have just been like, yeah, 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 not paying attention to the to the cutscenes. This is when I'm stepping away and going to the bathroom and coming back and being like, holy shit, this cutscene's still playing. Can I skip it? No, I can't. Why is the game like this? So for those players, they have Murphy say stuff out loud to remind you of, like, what you're supposed to be thinking about. 
instead of just having like an engaging story with memorable characters where you don't have to remind the player of anything because they remember important things because they're portrayed in an interesting way. Uh, instead, they just have stuff happen. And in case you forget, Murphy will just say stuff. Because sometimes you forget. Just like sometimes you forget about old friends. But then when you see them again, after a long time of, of being away, and you yell out to your friend that you haven't seen in a long time, by their first name. Fuck. Just like our friend Fuck. That's his name. Ah. Ow. Ah. Ow. Why are you like this? Stop it, Fuck. We're friends. Sometimes Fuck is like this. Sometimes he gets a little bit too ambitious. He starts dancing. And he's kind of a clumsy dancer. Don't mind me, fuck. I just need to go over here to this ladder. No. No. Thank you. I appreciate the help. I'll see you later. He's trying to help me break down the boards, but like I said, he's kind of clumsy. Oh. Don't worry, I got some instant clothes cleaning med kits in my back pocket. It's fine. So these are the weeping bad enemies. This is the first one we meet. We call this one fuck. Because Murphy always yells fuck when he sees him. He yells out to him, calls him by name. He's a good friend. And we'll see him we'll see him later. We'll see him and Murphy will yell out his name. Ah oh my god, that thing fell over. It made a loud noise and also dust. This sure is a scary horror game. Which county in Ireland is Murphy from? What do you mean? Just because of his name, Murphy Pendleton? Like a lot of Americans, he's probably descended from Irish immigrants. Just like me. Murphy is his first name. Pendleton is his last name, yeah. gone through the devil's pit we found information all this stuff talking about JP Sater and now uh, we see JP thinking over his life choices on the other side of the rails Sater oh it's just you what are you doing JP uh you know Enjoying the view. You know, they say if you were to put the Empire State Building in here, 
Wouldn't even reach halfway to the top of this place. Seems like a dangerous place to be sightseeing. You know, none of those things they said about me are true. The papers and stuff, people around town, my lawyers, they said it was just... circumstantial evidence and whatnot. That's what I kept telling them. Yeah, I read all about it. Those newspaper men are goddamn fucking liars. Relax, man, we're just, we're just talking here. What happened? That was an accident. I didn't mean to hurt nobody. I didn't murder nobody. Murder's a mortal sin. You go to hell for murder. Ain't that right, Murphy? Surely your mama taught you about what's oh. right and what's wrong. Those kids had parents that might disagree with you. The paper mentioned negligence. It was an accident! You were completely hammered. There were witnesses. And how about you, Murphy? Someone know all your dirty little secrets? I never hurt anybody that didn't deserve it. And I sure as hell never hurt any kids. I wouldn't be able to live with myself. <laughs> she call this living? Can you imagine what that's like, Murphy? Living all your life inside someone else's lie? Can you? <laughs> Listen to us talk. As if anybody out there gives a damn. And we're the ones who decide if we can live with what we've done. Okay, so not only have we come up to another choice where we can console or taunt and no other option. Those are our only two things that we could possibly do in this situation towards JP. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that just were said between JP and Murphy and how much I keep talking about the plot of this game sort of not really making a whole lot of sense and there's not really anything concrete about it because it all changes depending on endings so you get little bits of information like this you get Murphy saying sure as hell never hurt any kids he couldn't he would not be able to live with himself unless you get the ending where Murphy literally killed his own kid and wife and everything else and is being sentenced to the death penalty and does not care he's mocking Officer Sewell before like being put to death so not only does he kill kids but he lives with himself so already like certain endings the way they are completely contradict any element of these characters that we get and then we have um, what what JP says what JP Setter mentions can you imagine what that's like Murphy living your whole life inside someone else's lie that's supposed to be part of the plot of this game depending on what ending you get where Anne Cunningham is, is pursuing him and wanting revenge on him wanting to kill him had arranged for him to be sent to her prison just so that she would have the opportunity to kill him and if you get the ending where Murphy didn't do it then you have all this being directed at him from Anne Cunningham and it's not his fault it's something that literally Sewell did so he is living his life inside someone else's lie the same way that JP just mentioned but it depends on the ending you get you won't always get that ending and there is no one or the other ending to this game that's considered like canon or not canon because there's stuff that supports technically all of it and things that contradict every possible variant and ending as well so it's just like it's hard it's hard to talk about this game because there's a very obvious plot line that they intended for people to kind of get from it but there's so many elements of the story and with the endings to just contradict everything that they try to build up so what happened to Charlie, how Murphy felt about it, what Murphy's family was like, who Patrick Napier was, what Patrick Napier did, how they wind up in prison, whether Murphy kills him or not, like all these aspects that that really just change based on little bits of story here and there and then really 
go full throttle in lots of different directions once you get to the different endings. I guess the comic sort of gives a canon ending. I guess a little bit, but again, it's so frustrating that so much of the plot makes the most sense if you have the comic book, and only if you have the comic book with you like while you're playing this game. Alright. A lot of people are saying to taunt him, so let's taunt JP. Yeah, that's right. Take the easy way out. <laughs> that's what cowards do, right? Nothing easy about being a coward, Murphy. You ought to know that. Enjoy your stay. And that's it. World's better off without him. That's basically all your choice changes. It happens either way, but JP gives you a little bit more vague poetic advice before jumping off. And then Murphy, when he turns away and walks back from the rails, instead of saying that, world's better off without him, he says, I can't believe he jumped. And that's it. So basically you're saying they shouldn't have choices in multiple endings. That's not what I'm saying at all, Biohazard. I'm saying that they should have consistent storyline and plot and then have endings that branch off from consistent, you know, concurrent plot points. Silent Hill 2 has multiple choices and multiple endings, but the plot of the game, James killing his wife, going to Silent Hill, having a psychotic break, meeting Eddie, meeting Angela, all of that happens no matter what ending you get. The ending only changes how everything reacts at the end. If James decides to go through with it and kill himself, if he decides to change his life for the better and leave with Laura, if he decides to gather together all these ritual items and information and try to bring his wife back from the dead. All of these are viable endings to Silent Hill 2 and none of them change the overall plot of Silent Hill 2. The events of the game leading up to it and while the player's playing stay the same. The thing that changes is the outcome. Downpour's endings completely change the story. They completely change the plot of the game. They completely change who characters are and what their significance is, what their backstory is. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, you can have multiple options, you can have multiple endings, but it needs to branch off from one core consistent plot point. And this game does not do that. It just goes in all sorts of different directions with it. And they all just contradict each other. It all just contradicts the other endings and the other information that you get throughout the game. Entry to the Cave of Tears. The dark cavern before you was originally called Diu's Tusk Cavern. The cave contains the largest stalagmite in all of northeastern America and was first discovered by Chinese immigrant miners in 1863. The Chinese miners believed the giant stalagmite to be a large tusk protruding from Diu, which literally translates to Earth Prison in English. Do you get it? Do you get it? Prison? Do you get the symbolism? is considered the realm of the dead in Chinese mythology. Hence the name Dew's Tusk. Caves also the lifelong home to the weeping bat, a rare species of bat indigenous to the area. As a result, the cavern is also often referred to by locals as the Cave of Tears. The symbolism is too subtle. Please elaborate. Well, it's kind of a long story. You see, Murphy was in prison
Murphy didn't say the thing. This is not fuck. It's an imposter. That's not fuck at all. That's just a piece of shit. That's a big stalagmite. Okay, bye. Yeah. I'm gonna smash this. Give me the rock drill. If Harry Mason can use a rock drill... Oh, no. Why did you drop your thing? Ow. Ah, DMCA, turn it off. I just wanted to hear the little whisper sound. Get that little clip of uh, DJ Bobby Ricks asking if anybody's out there. I'm a little sad we don't get more, more Bobby Ricks. More Bobby Rick's backstory. Here goes nothing. Everything exploded. Well, we're about to meet Fuck again, our good friend. <clears throat> Here he is. Fuck. Hello, Fuck. Ah. Call him by name. You're not Fuck. See, Fuck is the friendly one. Not this guy. Fuck just wants to dance. Look at him go. This other guy, he's the fucking asshole. Oh my god, you can get up here? Fuck this. They're roommates. <laughs> Oh my god, they were roommates. Never let go of hope. One day you'll see that it's all come together. You'll look back and laugh at what's past, and you'll ask yourself, how the hell did I get through all that? Thanks, Officer Coolridge. Officer Cool Ranch, with those words of wisdom. More fatherly sounding advice. Yeah. But also something that I could imagine him saying to Murphy. Or to the other prisoners. Time for a puzzle. Nothing like finding a scrap of a poem on a charred, electrocuted corpse of a prisoner. 
Beneath the slate burns wicked ash, and the children cry for blood. Outside, fir trees blow in a wind that knows not what happened here, or that Toluca's subterranean claws seek blood, always blood. Wilkes. Leave me alone. Is the puzzle being able to read the poem itself? That's the hardest part of the puzzle, is reading it in your journal. This must be the train Seder told me about. The voice actor just sounds like he's half asleep for a lot of these lines. Like, they must have done these at the end of the day, the end of the recording session. They're like, okay, now we got to do the extra lines. These are just the little things that Murphy says to himself, you know, when you're walking around and exploring certain areas. This must be the ticket machine. This must be the train Seder told me about. He just sounds like he's falling asleep in the recording booth. Like that was the last shit they had to record. And he's already been there for like 12 hours. Devil's Train, jokingly called the Devil's Train by the miners that once worked in Devil's Pit. This mine train has since been converted into a ride for visitors. Equipped with a fascinating audio commentary, the Devil's Train provides the passengers with an in-depth educational tour of Devil's Pit, including an interactive reenactment of much of the pit's rich history. An in-depth educational tour in Silent Hill? Who the fuck would find that entertaining? That sounds boring. Just play the game. Please be advised that the tour includes the use of strobe lighting so passengers sensitive to such effects should take extra care. Also, please keep your hands inside the cart at all times as the Devil's Train passes through areas of the pit with very low ceilings and narrow passageways. Finally, we ask that you please refrain from using any flash photography that might disturb the native fauna. You'll piss off Fuck and the other weeping bats. Thank you for listening. Enjoy your ride on The Devil's Train. Thank you for listening. Listening to what? You made me read that shit. Did you bring up the cut E3 train ride monocle monster? I did earlier, but we can go into a little bit more detail now. So I mentioned that there was a lot of cut content from this game that people uh, who were doing game hacking, going through the game files, went through and looked at. And there were files still in the final version of the game for a boss that was originally going to be here. So whenever you would exit the mine tour and like all of this stuff, there's a big face that says, did you enjoy the ride, Murphy? Originally, there was more to that face and it was going to be like a full on boss fight for that segment that uh, just got completely cut. But the boss is still in the game files. Um, it has like tentacle whip attacks. It's got a few animations and things. It's mostly unfinished. It's obviously something that they didn't get to finish and include in the game, but it's surprising how much of it is actually still there. All right. So we need to press the buttons in the correct order to turn on the train. Holy shit, look at that texture pop in whenever you go from screen to screen. And this is one of those puzzles that suffers from the same thing that a lot of Silent Hill puzzles do, not just this game, um, even some of the original ones, where it it gives you a clue and a puzzle, and it gives you enough room to overthink it by way too much, so that you can just completely overthink a puzzle. Those are always the hardest puzzles, where they give you enough information and stuff, but they leave too many things not specific to where you can overthink it and just make it a lot harder on yourself to solve these things. And the difficulty that you play on changes how obvious this is. So we're on the hard difficulty, so we're getting the hardest version of this puzzle. 
which has lots of descriptive words that could essentially describe colors. Beneath the slate, slate could be gray. Wicked ash, ash could be red or orange uh, if it was burning, because beneath the slate burns wicked ash. If it's smoldering, it would be red or orange. If it's not, then it would just be like gray as well. And the children cry for blood, blood which is red. So you could already be looking at gray. You could be looking at orange. You could be looking at red. You have all these words, these sort of descriptors that are in place that you could pick up on. And not really any idea of like which one you're supposed to pay attention to, which ones you don't. So if you're playing this through on hard mode, or like a first playthrough doing hard puzzles, <clears throat> hard riddles. This one can be kind of frustrating, trying to figure out which descriptive things in the poem describe which colors you're actually supposed to focus on. But then outside fir trees blow in a wind that knows not what happened here, or that Toluca's subterranean claws seek blood, always blood. So again, we've got blood repeating, could be red, slate, which could be gray, fir trees, which could be green, wind, could be gray for like a lack of color, or Toluca's subterranean claws. Toluca is a lake, so Toluca itself could be inferred as blue. Subterranean claws could be reference to the stalagmites and stalactites, which are sort of grayish in color inside the cave. Again, repetition of blood that could be red. So many different things. Wish whoever wrote this wrote in higher resolution, right? I mean, we can zoom in on it. And this is one of the better notes in the game where you can actually read all of it in two segments instead of having to scroll down and have that awkward in between third segment. Gray, red, green, blue. Ash, blood, trees, and then Toluca itself. Those are the main ones that you're supposed to focus on. So, beneath the slate burns wicked ash, so that ash you're supposed to interpret as gray. Children cry for blood, you're supposed to interpret for red. Outside fir trees blow, supposed to interpret that for green. And then Toluca, you're supposed to interpret as blue for the lake. And ignore all the other descriptive words for no real reason. Trial and error. I've seen a lot of people just get through that by brute forcing it. They just guess until they get it. With stops at Hillside Station and the Superstition Taverns. Please keep your hands and arms inside the train at all times and remain seated until the train comes to a full and complete stop. Failing to comply with safety regulations can result in fear injury or death. Enjoy your ride and please, no flash photography. Before it became the charming resort town that we know and love today, Simon Hill was once the center of trade and commerce thanks to its rich scenes of coal and iron ore. You are riding aboard a fully restored mine train, originally owned and operated by the Gillespie Coal and Iron Company, which first began extracting ore from the Devil's Pit in 1860. Disney Magic. Mysterious symbols carved into the walls of limestone rock, leading to a wild speculation. 
Stop it, fuck. I need my face. There's the monocle, stretchy face boss. The little bit of it that we see uh, that's still in the game that was originally going to be a much more fleshed out like boss fight. Would have been interesting. The stock crashing sound. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, noticeable stock sounds in this. There is in the original Silent Hill games as well, so I can't, like, hold that over the originals or anything, but a lot more noticeable in certain games than others. This game, Silent Hill 4, even Silent Hill 4, it's really noticeable how many, like, unaltered stock sounds are in that. Pendleton. And there's Anne Cunningham. If you want to find out what happened to her after she fell and how she got here, I saw you. Gotta go read the comic the book. I said, up against the wall. You don't have to do this. We should help each other. This place, I. I don't know what it is or how we got here. You know, one thing I. Just shut up. What the. Where did you get this? Where in the hell did you get this? I just found it in these clothes. I didn't... Is this some kind of sick joke to you? No, I, I swear. I don't know what's going on any more than you do. On your knees. What? On your fucking knees. You heartless bastard. You don't deserve to live. You're not fit to walk this earth while good, decent Wait. men. I don't know who you think I am or what you think I've done. Shut the hell up! You think this is funny, don't you? Well, let's see how funny it is with a fucking bullet in your head. So at that moment, Anne Cunningham had a flash in her mind. Like, she had a flashback to a memory of a time when she was a little girl and her father, Frank Coleridge, was giving her some some sound life advice. But we only Go. see that in the comic book. We only see that from her perspective in the comics. What the hell are you waiting for? Leave me alone, God damn it! It is Hawk. I explained the badge earlier when we picked it up, along with the new clothes. So the clothes that Murphy's wearing, that he found uh, laying on a bed after coming up from um, that like underground area on the lift. He picks up uh, some clothes. Inside the clothes, there's a key and a badge. And the badge is the one that he's got right there that uh, Anne Cunningham just took from him. And it is her father, Frank Coleridge's service badge. 
But why'd she let Murphy go? So she, the whole time, Anne Cunningham has just been wanting to kill Murphy. Like, all she wants is revenge because she believes that Murphy was the one that nearly killed her father. Basically put him into a wheelchair. He couldn't talk. He had brain damage. He had to be fed. He couldn't go to the bathroom. You know, couldn't do anything on his own. Um, and died after some time, you know, sort of living like that. Anne blames Murphy for that. And she's been setting up for a long time to have an opportunity to get her revenge and kill Murphy. She finally got her chance to have him transferred from the prison that he was in to the prison that Anne works at, where she would take advantage of that fact and take her opportunity to kill him. Then the bus crashes on the way to that prison. That's the whole intro part of the game. And now at this point, Anne has basically got her chance. She's gotten up to him. She's gotten, you know, her opportunity to just shoot Murphy in the head right now. And she can't do it. So during that moment in the comics, it kind of flashes inside Anne's mind. And we see that she has this memory of her father when she was a little girl and said that she wanted to be a police officer or that she wanted to be a prison guard the same as her father. And her her dad, Frank Coleridge, sort of asks her, like, you know, why do you want to do that? And she says she wants to beat up bad guys. Like, she just wants to, to take care of bad guys. And, like, um, Frank gives her some, some fatherly advice about, like, now, most of the time, it's more like babysitting. And he says, in the end, most of those bad guys aren't really so bad. Um, I'm kind of paraphrasing. Let me see if I I can pull up the page. I think this is it, actually. Um, you sh just show it on stream here. I said, I don't want to go through the whole comic throughout this. The purpose of the stream is more to focus on the game and the comic being something separate outside of the game. Like, I like to try to include that kind of information when I can, but I also just want to just want to share sort of what the game is like on its own as well. So I don't want to show the whole comic or anything, but at the very least we can show some of these panels. But yeah, this panel is, is essentially the last little segment of what's going on in the comic. This memory that Anne kind of has at that moment when she's pointing the gun at Murphy and suddenly decides, I can't do it. It's mostly because of this. Um, she's looking at his name badge thing that, you know, if she grows up to be a, uh, a jail policeman, just like her dad, that she's going to have a name tag too. And Coleridge says, well, they're actually called name ca name tags, kiddo. And yep, I'll bet you'll have your very own someday. Hopefully on your doctor's uniform. And says, nah, -uh, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a jail policeman just like you. Frank says, oh, Lord, if your mother was still alive to see what I've created. So you're absolutely sure you want to be a corrections officer like your old man, huh? And why is that, Annie? <clears throat> And says, because I want to beat up the bad guys every day, just like you do, pal. Frank says, well, kiddo, hate to break it to you, but my job really isn't about beating up bad guys. It's mostly about babysitting. Besides, if I'm doing my job right, guess uh, what a lot of those bad guys really are. And says, what, daddy? Frank says, they're really just good guys waiting to happen. A very Frank Coleridge fatherly advice 
thing to say. So that memory is what's going through Anne's mind while she's sitting there with this gun pointed at Murphy's head. And she thinks of her father, Frank. And finally sort of tells herself, like, this, this remembering, hey, these aren't really necessarily bad guys. Some of them are good guys just waiting to happen. And it's enough to make her stop. Make her reconsider what she's doing. Come on. Hey, maybe if we stick together, we can... Go Some... away. Miss, uh... Ma'am. Fuck off. I think you should leave now. Oh, for God's sake, leave me alone! Oh. It's just you. I... I thought for a minute we were someone else. We see that, uh... That recurring phrase throughout the game. That, oh, it's just you reaction to Murphy. We see it from Anne Cunningham. We see it from J.P. Sater. We see it from the uh, child in the orphanage later. All these uh, kind of recurring moments where they're just reacting to Murphy as though he's always been there already. Like, oh, it's just you. Which I think plays a little bit into that idea that they toy with in this iteration of Silent Hill, that Silent Hill is effectively this kind of purgatory. And that people are reliving these moments in their lives. Um, for DJ Bobby Ricks, it's reliving this moment in his life, spinning record after record as the DJ. Uh, for Howard Blackwood, it's delivering the mail. So it, it gives a little bit of implication that maybe Murphy has and Anne are going through this. Maybe they've already been through it. And that there's this familiarity that occasionally breaks through in the way that these characters kind of address him, like, oh, it's just you. We're still here. It's just you. And then we don't get any more dialogue from her. Well, that's about it for The Devil's Pit. We're about, we've got a little bit more to go, but uh, we're about a little over four hours in. I need to go take a short break, check on my cats, grab another drink, and uh, just take a moment to stretch and stuff. So, this will be the first break of the stream. Uh, just like all the other streams in the past, we're going to sit down and do this all in one sitting. Downpour usually is a pretty long playthrough. Um... So we will be here for a while, um, usually at least 12 hours or so, maybe longer, depending on how much side quest stuff we do, if I stop and pull up more of the comic and that kind of thing. So it, it just kind of depends. But either way, we'll be going through and talking about the whole game, the whole plot. Uh, but thank you all so much for hanging out and joining me so far. Um, but yeah, going to take a few minutes and be right back to more Downpour. Back in a few. Thank you. 
All right. What track is this? Uh, whenever I go to the BRB screen, it's usually uh, a track called Eternal Rest from Silent Hill 1. It's the result screen music from the first Silent Hill game. This one tries with story. Gameplay not good. I feel like the gameplay... I mean, I feel like the gameplay is not good. I feel like the story is also not good. The core ideas of the game are fine. They're just not told in a very good way. Execution of the pacing and the plot reveal is uh, is not very good. On top of the gameplay also not being good. I don't know. I not not a fan of this one. It I said it's not like the worst thing. It's not like it has no merit. There's definitely aspects of its story and some of its characters that I like, but Oh, boy, it's rough. It's rough. It's hard for me to like this one. What is exactly the meaning of the rabbit? Uh, for the BRB screen, it's a clip from a Silent Hill music video that was made by Team Silent. Back around uh, the early 2000s, Silent Hill uh, 2, 3, and 4, there were some little short animated music videos that Team Silent made. Um, a series of three. So there's one called Fukuro that is based on Pyramid Head and a nurse character from Silent Hill 2. Um, there's one called Usagi, which is based on the Robbies in their costume and stuff, uh, which is what my... BRB screens from, and then one called Kinoko, which is kind of based on Silent Hill 4 imagery. Is there any meaning of rabbit in Silent Hill universe? They're a mascot for the Lakeside Amusement Park, a uh, an amusement park that is in Silent Hill. So they're first introduced in Silent Hill 3, in that version of the amusement park. See uh, their mascot costumes everywhere. And then they were just popular after that, so almost every game after Silent Hill 3 has Robbie in it, in some form or another. Electric water. It's very good for you to step in. This for PlayStation 4? I don't think it's compatible on PS4. It was released for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. You can play it on Xbox One through backwards compatibility, which is how I'm playing it. Um, but I don't think PS4 plays PS3, right? Because it's not digital. It would have to play off of the actual disc. <clears throat> Might be on PS Now, but fuck PS Now. Yeah, I did a stream of HD collection on PS Now many years ago. When PS Now, like, first kind of had started. Um, Maybe not when it first started, but... Yeah. I did that on PS3. I did a stream called Worst of the Worst. Where I was playing the worst possible versions of Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3. <clears throat> which was playing the HD collection via the PS Now PlayStation streaming service. Um, on an original old first model PlayStation 3. That was like worn out. So it was like an old console that didn't run very well using a streaming service that didn't work very well to play the HD collection worst possible versions of Silent Hill 2, Silent Hill 3. That was a fun stream. 
I had originally planned to do more of that. More, more episodes of Worst of the Worst and just play the worst possible versions of all the games in the series. But I never really followed up on it. I don't know how interested people would even still be to see that. To see, like, what's the worst possible version of, like, Silent Hill 1 that you can play? Let me tell you about an early PS1 emulator for Dreamcast called Bleemcast. It ran PS1 games on the Dreamcast, technically, but very, very badly. DMCA. Techie did a marathon like that last year. Silent Hill 2 and 3 on HD Collection, Homecoming on PC, etc. Man, that sounds about right. Anytime I think I've got like a good idea to do something with the Silent Hill series, it's almost going to be a guarantee that like Techie or somebody has done it. Techie's been doing Silent Hill stuff for so long now. Ooh, flashlight. Like anything you might try to think of to do with these games, I'm sure Techie's done it. The DMCA boss fight. Pretty much. Another pack of uh, Hemingway lights. You can actually see the uh, brand name on it on this one. It's close enough to the camera. one of the only consistent things about the Western Silent Hill games. That pack of cigarettes, that brand of cigarettes. They first advertise them on a billboard at the very beginning of Silent Hill Origins. Uh, Curtis is smoking them in Homecoming. You find a pack of them as a memento in Shattered Memories. And then you see him around here and uh, DJ Bobby Ricks smokes them in downpour. Think Bleemcast would be an original still? Maybe that would be what I could try to do, is find a little bit more obscure, bad ways to play the Silent Hill games. Because it's like, okay, we could do Bleemcast, Silent Hill 1, we can do PS Now HD Collection for Silent Hill 2 and 3. Uh, worst version of Silent Hill 4. Original Xbox version on Xbox 360 backwards compatibility. It, uh, it breaks the models and textures in the game. So a lot of textures don't display the way that they're supposed to. And uh, character models, you can see, like, where all of their face polygons are supposed to merge. So when, like, you're talking to characters in cutscenes, their faces are, like, opening and closing polygons. It looks really fucked up and weird. <clears throat> so, yeah, we could do 360 backwards compatibility for Silent Hill 4. Uh, Origins. What can we do for Origins? Neither version of Origins is particularly good. But for different reasons. And I'm trying to figure out which one would actually be worse. Because it's way... The graphics are not as good. And there's a lot of issues with it on PSP. 
Uh, but on PS2, the graphics are better, but the game's dark as shit, and it also has a lot of weird texture problems. And if you emulate either version, PSP or PS2, there's all sorts of things that are fucked up with it. Textures that don't display right, flashlights that don't work right. So there's already lots of shitty variations of Origins to play. I'm just not sure which one would really be worst of the worst. Most important weapon in the game for the speedrun is that battle axe. Saves a lot of time later on because there's going to be a door that you need to break down that you need to like chop through or boards that you need to chop through with an axe. But there's a scripted event later where no matter what, if you've got a fire axe at that point, no matter the condition of it or anything like that, even if it's brand new, once you start chopping through those boards, that axe will 100% every single time break. It, it forces you into a scripted event where your axe will break and you've got to go out of your way to get another one because there's a whole sequence of like pulling an axe out of a body and it triggers an event. But if you have this battle axe, which was a special DLC bonus quote-unquote DLC bonus, uh, you can keep the battle axe. The battle axe doesn't count. It doesn't follow the same rules as the fire axe. So you can chop through those boards without having to get that extra axe and do that whole extra sequence. Also comes with a nail gun. Pretty good. But yeah, you can skip a whole sequence by having that battle axe. And what you have in this locker is dependent on what code you actually use to open the locker for the first time. And I say for the first time because you've really got to go out of your way to delete any trace of this game on your console to reset this locker. I know a lot of people who speedrun this game, and because of the speedrun route, you need to have this battle axe in the locker. You only get the battle axe if you use a specific code on the locker, and you have to already have done it in order to get to the locker in a run and have it already be open. So all these steps, just to save some time, uh, people discovered, like, it's a real pain in the ass deleting your save data off of some consoles and getting that locker to reset. Because those were meant to be, like, game pre-order exclusive things. So if you pre-ordered through Best Buy or whatever you'd get a code, and that code would give you a particular set of weapons in that locker. But if you got it through GameStop, it would be a different code and a different set of weapons. So there was like five or six different variations of things that you can get out of that locker, depending on where your game was pre-ordered from and what code you put in. But it's just a numerical code. So it didn't even matter if you pre-ordered the game at all or where you bought it from, because... This game came out in 2012. The internet existed. So people just bought the game and then shared the codes online. And anybody could use them, no matter what. What the heck is wrong with publishers? I know, right, Santi? And uh, now that we're through Devil's Pit and we're actually, like, here, this is uh, Silent Hill. Our objectives have been updated. Escape from Silent Hill. Made it to Silent Hill seems quiet. Where is everyone? Need to find a way out of town and never, ever look back. That's where we are. I'm going to try to do a little bit of running around and exploring. The little speedrunner side of my brain is sh like screaming at me. 
knowing to just go exactly where I know to go because there's not going to be anything really interesting if I uh, come through this side and look around at all the stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, I always just go directly where I need to. I should explore and see what else is out there. And then I explore and see what else is out there and I remember, oh right, nothing. Not really anything. How did you feel when you played this game for the first time? Um, disappointed, pissed off, confused. I've been playing all the Silent Hill games since the first one. Like, I played it when I was like 12 in 1999. Or uh, very early 2000. The ground is pretty soft here. And I've been a fan of this series since pretty much the first one. Really after the second one. So by the time Downpour came out, I was already set for disappointment. Because I didn't really like Origins. I didn't really like Homecoming. I thought Shattered Memories was okay. I thought Shattered Memories was like kind of starting to go in a better direction. So I had a little bit of hope for Downpour. And then I had less and less hope for Downpour the more I saw about it before release. And then after it came out and I finally got to play it, it was um, disappointing. Don't you like corn or what? I mean, admittedly, like, I was fine with corn. I listened to corn back in the day when new metal was getting popular and, like, being a thing. But it doesn't fit Silent Hill very well. That's kind of this game in general. A lot of stuff about it's really not as bad as a lot of people make it seem. I think there are definitely a lot of things that are major issues, but a lot of stuff in this game is not as bad as a lot of people make it out to be. It's just not very fitting for Silent Hill. I don't think the enemies look very good, but that's in comparison to, like, horrible, monstrous Masahiro Ito creatures. You know, if they're compared to, like, condemned criminal origins, they're about the same, you know? Like... More of it is just, in comparison to other Silent Hill games, as a Silent Hill game, this one really is lacking. Hey, look, a shovel. Now we can go dig. Any interest in doing some Perfect Star rating runs at the first few games? Love to see your thought process when getting perfect ratings. Uh, maybe. They're mostly a pain in the ass. There are definitely a few little tricks to it. Um, for doing 10 stars. That would be interesting to kind of show. But, I don't know. What the hell? I feel like it's kind of boring. It's a lot of, like... This is the most efficient way to kill enemies, and now you're just going to watch me stop and go out of my way and kill all the enemies the exact same way every time. You know, here's every item pickup in the game, just going out of my way and picking up all the extra little health drinks and bullets and showing all that stuff. I'm sure some people will find that interesting, and how to do certain things quickly and efficiently on harder difficulties to get 10-star ratings, like can be interesting to show some of those strategies and stuff, I guess. But I don't know. I've always found 10 star runs and, and stuff like that kind of boring. They're very meticulous. They're very easy to mess up. We found a Silent Hill artifact. We can view these in the extras menu. Well, where is that? Where's that extras menu? 
all I see is resume and load. We can look at our options. We can frame pack our stereo 3D. Turn off those tutorials. Turn on our object highlighting, etc. Nope. You have to completely exit the game. You have to completely quit. So that you can come back to the title screen, go to this extras menu, and then from here, you can view the same statistics from uh, your in-game stat screen for some reason. This also sort of works like your result screen after finishing a playthrough. And then you have your gallery and your collectibles. All your unlockables. And for some reason, the frame rate in the menu is terrible. <clears throat> Sewell, I thought you to be one of those okay guards, the ones who play by the rules, a proper bastard but fair. But you just love to play those games of yours, don't you? Offering a deal that is hard to decline. Well, I couldn't. There's lore. There's extra lore from this stuff. The postman. Howard. Something tells me this guy's somehow more than just an ordinary postman. The way he talks, the way he moves. I mean, he's way too relaxed for this ridiculous place. He's at home here, all right. I still can't figure out whether I should fear him or trust him. But still, he's the closest thing to what I would call a reasonable person around here. How about that collectible we just picked up? Radio. The Radio from Silent Hill. We also have a toy van. A toy van that looks like Pat Napier's van. Except that's not a van at all, because this game is very good. And they even managed to get menu things wrong, like the correct picture of the correct car. Look at that toy van. Still don't get the postman thing? Does he exist because of the movie? He exists because of a comic book. We, uh, we explained it earlier. But he is a character from one of the comics called Silent Hill Past Life. He's here to represent what the town is in this game. Because the town and the power and everything surrounding Silent Hill is very different in this game from anything else in the series. In this game, it's treated like a purgatory. So Howard is here to prove that uh, people can just be stuck in time in this town for like hundreds of years. And uh, this side quest... If you take the time to keep these shovels and go around town and dig up all these artifacts, we'll get you the surprise ending, which is essentially this game's version of the joke endings. Um, I don't really want to do that for this playthrough. I want to try to show some of the other endings. But at some point in the near future... I plan on going back through all the games again, doing some further in-depth playthroughs and showing stuff that I didn't um, in all the ones that I've done in this past couple weeks. So that way I can show some of the endings that I didn't show. For Silent Hill 2, I, I want to go back and show Born From a Wish, because I didn't do that on the main playthrough. Um, and we can show more endings for that game as well. Some uh, some more of the Silent Hill 1 endings. Show all the UFO endings. 
from uh, across the series. All the joke endings, that kind of stuff. Because even when I do these in-depth ones, there's there's lots of stuff that I miss. I can't really, like, possibly show and talk about absolutely everything on, like, a single playthrough for any of these games, really. But we'll definitely go back and revisit. That fucking block animation. It's just like so fast and the camera snap. Don't want to play the game multiple multiple times to show every ending in one stream. See, you you say Kappa, but I've done that. I've done uh, 24 hour streams where I just do a full playthrough from beginning to end, show an ending, start over, another playthrough, beginning to end, show another ending until I've shown every ending. I've done that for multiple games in the series. I've as with Silent Hill, I've been doing this since, you know, 2015, so. Keep the saves. Even when I keep the saves, I reinstall these games. I buy new hardware. I lose memory cards and hard drives and stuff like that. I've been streaming the games constantly since 2015 and playing them all the time even before that. I don't care about the saves. Just for the sake of showing everything, I play the games enough. We can we can always play them again and show more stuff. A hey, side quest time. We're exploring the town. We're doing stuff. I hear a lady crying. Coming down here and doing this side quest actually gets us a look at a future enemy a bit early, if I remember correctly. Missing, Lindsay Jacobs. Reported missing in Boston. Uh, May 28th, approximately 4 feet tall, 60 pounds, black hair, brown eyes, last seen wearing a red blouse with a red skirt. If you have any information about me, please contact 1-800-555-3400. Missing child. There's the uh, nail gun. Sure, let's go ahead and take it. We could have picked that up in the locker, uh, the, the extra thing, extra DLC pre-order bonus locker. But if you miss it from there, you can always pick it up here. And if you did pick it up there, picking it up there, uh, here in this house just gives you more ammo for it. crying in the darkness. It's very scary. It's just like PT. Turning the knob on the TV, everything breaks. 
And the lock is opened. We get the opportunity to actually get like a real gun. Even over our, uh, our nail gun here. Sure, let's go ahead and take it. And we get a new enemy for it. The mannequins of this game, which are more ghost-like. You have these, like, actual bodies, mannequin bodies that uh, will be in one area of the room, and then they make little ghosts, ghost copies of themselves, little chase you around and attack you. But we don't see that enemy normally until much later in the game. You get kind of an early glimpse at it just by coming down and doing this uh, little side quest just to get a gun, which I'll now throw on the ground. We'll keep it. At least not a floating cage. Oh, yeah. It could have been the amazing floating cage with a shadow. The best enemy design ever from Origins. Instead, it's a weird sex doll mannequin ghost maker thing. Much better. I guess technically it is better. Still not very good. And optional notes. Things you can find around. Missing child poster for Charlie Pendleton. Murphy's son. Local missing child, last seen at Robbins Elementary School. If you have any information about Charlie Pendleton, please contact the Boston Police Department immediately. It's 17555-4775. Please help. It's just a rock. Get out of here. My axe. Murphy from Boston. They make lots of references to, uh, like, Boston areas around, as opposed to um, earlier games like Silent Hill 3, making references to, like, Portland, making references towards Maine. That all just loops around. Oh yeah, we can go into the subways, although nothing is really going to be open yet. Is Homer down here already? No, Homer's not even down here. He's on one of the other ones. There's like a homeless man that you can find to do a side quest for. And he opens up these subways that sort of act like shortcuts. Well, quote-unquote shortcuts from... 
one side of the town to the next, but there's not really a whole lot of reason. It's very rare that I even take the time and go through and do this. Because by the time you get to the end of the game, when you've got everything to fully unlock all these shortcuts and stuff, you're not really doing a whole lot of backtracking across the town. Not enough to where you'd want to go out of your way and use these subway systems anyway. But hey, we got a painting. We're going to need that for a side quest that I'm probably not actually going to finish. And it leads off down that way. There's lots more you can go down here, but it, it's just going to lead to a gate that we won't be able to get through until this side quest is done later. Screamer. <laughs> no screaming today. From downtown. It was a good shot. So here you can get a little bit of an idea somewhere you could potentially get to. If you can get up there and cross that bridge, climb into that window. Oh god, not the patrol car. So there are patrol cars that are scattered around the town. That are being driven around by dirty ladies. I'm not even joking. That's that's a thing. There's a side quest that you can do to make the cop cars go away. But otherwise, they're just patrol cars full of enemies. Full of those screamer enemies. That are just joyriding around the town. And if you get too close to one of the cars... The screen fades to black and then fades back in and it spawns a bunch of those uh, screamer ladies and you have to either try to run away from them or deal with trying to fight them. Most of the time you just run away. Same way you handle like combat in most Silent Hill games. Just fucking run. They could have done something better than that. Oh, they absolutely should have done something better than that. Than just, like, a patrol car that drives around and turns into enemies. It's fucking weird. Oh, evidence photo. Charlie Pendleton's body. After it was pulled out of the lake. I pointed this out earlier during the running segment. We saw a body in a bag strapped onto a bed that was uh, just before the running segment in, like, the early part of the game. And it's this exact same bag. Oh, God. Why are you doing this to me? And there's Murphy's reaction to seeing a crime scene photo of his dead son in a bag oh god why are you doing this to me I guess they didn't want to give away too much story or anything by this point but it's still uh, not much of a reaction at least something We got to get some more iconic Silent Hill balance beam segment going. Well, 
Thanks. And now we're in a building, so the game's got to load. Lore-wise, what actually happens when a character dies in Silent Hill? All sorts of different things can happen, because it's not consistent from game to game. The town doesn't work the same way from experience to experience, from game to game. and no, There's no one answer to that. Most of the time, when somebody dies in Silent Hill, they're just dead. They're dead just like if they would have died anywhere else. But sometimes people can come back as ghosts. Sometimes people can be manifested through memories of them that other people have. Lots of different things can occur. I just want to hear the Bobby Rick segments, not the licensed music. Trying to get my entire stream muted. My channel taken down. Hey Wexford, welcome back. You kind of see what I mean about exploration and stuff by this point. Like, we've seen these wall textures. We've seen these window textures. These are the same books. I stopped and looked at, like, bookshelves in that first house, and it was like, oh, books on guitar making. There's that same row of books, the guitar making stuff. So after a while, it just kind of gets boring looking into the details of the environment in this game because they stop changing. Like, they, they start reusing stuff so often that, uh, yeah, there's not a lot to, like, say or absorb or think about or look at in the environments the more you play. But hey, I guess it makes when there is something to look at stand out a little bit more. Little side quest area. Steal the money, Murphy. Steal it. It's fine. Like that painting of the girl. I'm gonna see that same painting over and over. Hammer. No, thank you. But yeah, just going through and exploring. There's a little side quest to do here in the apartment. I'm gonna need to find some items and return them to the rooms that they uh, kind of belong to. I think if we go downstairs, it's going to trigger the scene with Howard. Yeah, so we don't want to do that yet. Silent Hill, even in the first game, there's tons of stuff to look at in each area. Yes. That is one of the things is like, it might not be typical in a lot of other games to have those kind of detailed environments, but it was frequent enough in the Silent Hill games, even from the very first one. Like, 
There's lots of things to look at on the streets. All the buildings and storefronts and stuff are like pretty unique looking. Uh, there's little posters and stuff stuck all around the town. Little things to find and look at. Um, and that might not seem like too big a deal, but for a game series like this where you're spending so much time in the environments, just sort of looking around, um, it makes a difference having something interesting to actually look at. You know, having something that you can invest in time-wise while you're exploring your environments. It makes a big difference having that. Yeah, we can flush toilets. Finally, something we can do. Lots of little things in the apartments. I said right now it's just sort of setting up for this side quest. Seeing what items can go where. And then we have a note. Dear shithead, I'm on to you, you junky asshole. Next time something goes missing from my apartment, you can expect the cops to come knocking on your door. And if it's not them, it'll be me. And my knock is 12 gauges, if you catch my drift. So if you don't want an ass full of buckshot, I suggest you stay the fuck away from my apartment. Last warning. A thief, huh? Thank you, Murphy. In case you couldn't read and figure that out from the note. There was a junky asshole in the apartments who was a thief. Taking everybody's shit. We need to get stuff back from the thief and go and return it to their rightful homes in the apartments. Yep, there he is. You junkie asshole. Why'd you steal everybody's shit? This must be all the stuff he took. Money box. Pocket, war metal, gold watch. All right, Deus Ex. Have a good night. Take it easy. There's like all these crying sound effects. Okay. Lock it. Here you go. We made the ghost happy. Over here, we can hear a ticking sound for the gold watch. <gasps> sound of gasping and footsteps. And I feel like this is a good representation of why I almost never bother with doing any of the side quests in this game. 
Because, like, you see how fulfilling this is? You see how much more we're learning about the main characters and the main plot? Oh. Maybe not really. Maybe not so much. Feel like this is a bunch of nothing? Exactly. And that's kind of how a lot of the side quests feel. Like, yeah, I guess I'm doing something. But it doesn't feel like I'm doing anything meaningful. Like, none of this feels significant for the rest of the story, or the characters, or anything, really. It's just sort of here to, like, take up time. Take up a little bit of time. Did I miss the spot for the war medal? No. Please, God, no. Dude, I keep getting stuck on corners. Trying to move through doorways. What motivation does the protagonist have to do any of this? Just walking around Silent Hill. He's just walking around. He is just walking around doing stuff. Anything else back out here? This is just the radio. That leads back out to the streets. But no, Murphy doesn't really have too much motivation to do this. All he's doing is looking for a way out of town. As far as your objectives, your main objective is just escape from Silent Hill. Find a way out of town, never ever look back. But we found things. So now also return the stolen items to their rightful owners. The thief stole these people's things. Maybe I can set things right by returning them to the rightful owners. Maybe you could, but why? What does this do for you? What is the point? And I hate to make, like, a big deal of it, but... Again, when I talk to a lot of people who are fans of this game... And sort of... Sort of defend it whenever I do these kind of playthroughs, I usually get a lot of feedback from people who are like, I can't believe you don't like this game, it's one of my favorites. There's just all these things you don't understand about it. And I'm like, help me understand. Help me, help me realize what it is that I'm missing about the game. A lot of people bring up the point that it's like, oh, it's so open, you can explore so much of the town and do all these extra things. And I'm like, yep, here we are, exploring and doing the extra things. And, uh... I don't know, I don't get what people enjoy about this. Spooky rocking chair. Oh, here's where we uh, put the war medal. Hear those war sounds of battle. But even aside from, like, the sound effects and stuff going on... There's there's still not, like, you know... It's the same furniture, the same books, same bookshelves. They stick one little jacket off in the corner. Like, there you go. There's a military jacket in here. There's some sound effects. 
This is the Purple Heart from World War II. Somebody's memories. We've returned them to where they belong. Yeah, achievement. Wasn't that satisfying? Wasn't that good? Isn't it a good thing that we did that? Give me that painting. Give me that baby painting. I'm gonna need these to clutter up my inventory for another side quest that I'm not gonna finish. Another battle axe, if you didn't pick one up earlier. Go ahead and take it. Side quest within a side quest, yeah. We're in full on find things for the side quest while you complete the other side quest. So we, we returned everything. I did it. Other than my gamer score going up. What did I get for that? He's gone. We get his clothes. Wasn't that a cool reward? We did it. We did a side quest. Now we can wear a dead thief man's clothes. Maybe they're warmer. See, if that was a mechanic, then sure. If they had gone with the find clothes to survive the cold element from the the Shattered Memories pitch, Silent Hill Cold Heart. If you had, like, better defense or stats or something tied to the clothes that you pick up throughout the game. Sure, something. Any anything, any purpose to it would be fine. But it's just like, nope, here you go. Uh, it's a cosmetic. Let's go talk to Howard. Intended. Still in town, I see. Just haven't found a way out. Yeah. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Yeah? Then what? Well, let's just say I could finally put this damn bag down for starters. Man, cut the bullshit. What is this place? Can't say I understand the question. This is a busy town. Do you think these letters deliver themselves? Whatever. Can you at least tell me where the radio station is? Someone's been calling in, making these <laughs> dedications to me. Oh, sure. That'd be the tall building in the center of town. Big old monster of a clock at the top. Shouldn't be hard to find. By the way, I ran into that lady friend of yours. 
What in the world you do to get that young woman so riled up anyway? She was fit to be tied. Tell you the truth, I got no idea. <laughs> Son, in my experience, when someone's that angry, it ain't a mistake. It's personal. And again, the comic book covers that bit of story that we didn't see. So Howard the mailman ran into Anne Cunningham. He mentions, you know, having seen her, having talked to her. So we see that interaction between Anne and Howard in the Anne story comic, but never in the game. Basically, every aspect of the comic is stuff that I wish I could have seen in the game somehow. I don't know why they were so determined to make that a thing with the Silent Hill series of like putting major pieces of lore and story and character backgrounds on like supplementary materials. It's only on the website or, uh, you know, it's only in a comic book. I mean, Dr. Grimm, with Born from a Wish, it was at least included with every version of Silent Hill 2 outside of the very, very first PS2 release. Every version of Silent Hill 2 after that, it was like, it was included. It was part of the story of that game. And Born from a Wish is like super inconsequential for what it is. It tells you a lot of stuff that you can pretty much figure out already from the main scenario. <clears throat> it doesn't... It's not like holding off as much information as this game puts aside in like uh, Anne's story or what Silent Hill 4 put on the website or what Homecoming put on the website. Let's go grab a shovel. <clears throat> we can get another easy artifact here. God, my allergies have been terrible lately. My throat is just like destroyed. Is Maria a real person? No. Maria is a manifestation of James's desires for a wife, but sexy and not sick. <clears throat> Hyper blaster. Fancy gun. Too bad it doesn't work. Anne is the actual protagonist. Uh, I agree. I think this game works much, much better from Anne's perspective. That's one of the elements of the comic book that I think shows, like, the strongest. I could understand playing part of the game as Murphy, just to sort of set up this perspective of things. Oh, God. Death by Fugu, thank you so much for the resub. Appreciate the 11 months of support. Thank you, thank you. So, like, showing things from Murphy's perspective, not an entirely bad idea, but, oh man, it is so much more relevant to Anne Cunningham and her perspective that I really, really wish we would have seen more of that in the in the game itself. Not just uh, sort of put aside years after the game comes out in the form of the comic book. And I know people will have like a fucking week-long argument sitting here and talking about what is and is not canon and how to define it and all that. Um, 
So, however, you consider canon, like, for the comic and uh, things of that nature, it's made by the same writer. Like, same people who worked on the game were the same people who made the comic. It just came out years afterwards. Side quest! There's a toilet. Stick your hand in it. Do it, Murphy. Will no one rise to the level of James? Fender's Fine Art and Appraisals. October 3rd. Dear Mr. Rice. Uh... The Delia painting in your collection needs to be in a public gallery, not the private home of an eccentric recluse who selfishly hoards such treasures for his sole enjoyment. I've tried repeatedly to get you to accept my generous offers to purchase the painting. Once again, you rebuff me, leaving me no choice but to take drastic measures. It would be extremely unfortunate if certain details regarding your son's suicide were made public. Give me the painting and I'll assure you that these allegations will never see the light of day. Refuse me and face the consequences. Sincerely, Melissa Matlin. So there's a... An art fan. Clearly. Who owned a painting that this person wanted. In order to put it in a gallery was willing to expose some information about this art collector's son committing suicide. Fucking horrible. Disrespectful. Fender's fine art and appraisals. How large is the map? 3x3 three three grid? Maybe I don't need the entire map to find the treasure. Who has the missing paintings? Cross-check with Art Collector Quarterly. He's buying New England 19th century oils. Mr. Rice won't return calls. Right. Dr. Whatever. Mr. Ban Banker? Banter? Refuses to sell. And whatever. What do the symbols mean? Native American. Maybe Algonquin. All Pat at Silent Hill uh, Historical Society. Maybe he knows. Ravens, death, burial site. So this all plays into an overall larger... These look like different locations. ...side quest. Like different locations. So there's a lot of different locations that we can go and check out to try to find all of these places to get paintings as well as items, artifacts that we have to place around town. And I can summarize a lot of this really quickly. It's a, it's more of that mindless busy work of the first quest that we were doing just on a much much larger scale. And ultimately, your reward is a melee weapon that, just like all other melee weapons, you get to a point of no return in the game where you lose all your shit anyway. Even if it's rare quest, side quest, you know, unique items. September 14th. Dear Mr. Barker, thank you for returning my inquiry regarding the Liliana Shelley painting. It's wonderful to find another like-minded collector, especially one that's so familiar with the early work of this local artist. I was, however, extremely disappointed to hear that you have chosen to reject my offer to acquire this piece for my gallery. 
You have to understand that we are assembling what the art review has called the most important and extensive collection of Shelley's early oils ever displayed, and refusing to sell or lend the painting to the gallery is not only a disservice to Silent Hill, but an insult to the greater art community. The refusal to support this celebration of Shelley's work will only lead to misfortune. I beg you to carefully reconsider my offer. So this Melissa Matlin was trying very hard to put together this gallery of these particular paintings. This stuff that looks significant and none of it interactable. Sometimes <laughs> even just mashing Murphy up against some of these little crevices like this, I'll be surprised because it'll be something that he can, like, squeeze through. There's a lot of passages that I don't even realize are places that you can go uh, just because there's, like, a squeeze through or drop down or duck under type area. Context sensitive get past this point area. 3x3 three three grid. Yeah, no flavor text. That's one of the things that I hate. One of the things that's missing that I would very much like from this game. You don't really get a whole lot of flavor text. Almost none. I like being able to explore the environments and, like, look at stuff and get feedback from the character of, like, what I'm looking at. Even better if they'll say how it makes them feel. You get the best sort of sense of that from Silent Hill 3 with Heather talking about things as you interact with them in the environment. Even something really, really minor, she would give, you know, a bit of info about it. Even just saying that it's creepy or gross or whatever, it's like, okay, that says something about her character. When they don't give you, like, anything... It's a piece of the map. It's a piece of the map. I've got any of the parts that actually go together. Oh, that one does connect. Not the other ones yet. But at least we got those maps, <laughs> or the other paintings, out of our inventory. Like, I forgot to use this key for the second floor in that first house to get that pistol early on. So this key is just going to be in our inventory for, like, the rest of the game now.
You would take this over homecoming with the sexy nurses any day? I mean, hey, personal preferences, I guess. At least, kind of with homecoming, I still felt like, I don't know, I was doing stuff. So much of downpour, I don't know, I just feel like my brain starts shutting off. I'm just like, okay, I'm just plodding around the town. Like, I don't have a whole lot of motivation for what I'm doing or what this character wants. Oh, cool. And I'm also getting my ass kicked before I even have remotely, like, control of my character. Hell yeah. Forgot about him. Yo, Silent Hill, DJ Riggs here on WLMN-FM, and... Oh, now we don't even get licensed music. This creepy radio transmission after our message from DJ Bobby Ricks. Let's go ahead and swap the battle axe for this. There are going to be places where you can use these uh, harpoons to pull ladders down and get up onto some of these balconies. I don't think it lets you do it any of the spots in this alley. But there is an Easter egg in one of the balconies in, uh, in the town that we need one of these to... Uh, Pull the stairs down to get to, or the ladder down. Don't know what the game is trying to accomplish. Yeah, you just get that kind of general sense of like, okay, Murphy's a prisoner. He's done something. Like if you're playing this game blind at this point. I don't know. I don't know what you would really be feeling, like, motivation-wise. That sure is a noise. Oh, hey, that's you. Oh, hey, monsters riding around in a patrol car. See? There it is. Isn't that a thing? Isn't that great? My god, my entire game hitched. So at least we're marking stuff off. Centennial building. Some question marks for things marked, things to check out on the map. Yeah, the dirty lady patrol fucking caught up to me. Yeah, this is the most we really get for those ambient tones. People in chat talking about kind of the music and stuff. Yeah, exactly what Yoshio said. With all due respect to the late Daniel Leaked, his music score for this game is a whole lot of blah nothingness. I couldn't say it better, so I will take your words. But yeah, that's, uh, I, I completely agree with that sentiment. Daniel Leake is absolutely a great composer. Is he a good fit for Silent Hill? No, I don't think so. And was his work specifically on this, you know, anything especially good or stand out? No, I don't think so. Hey, look. 
an Easter egg. That's the whole reason I wanted the harpoon. It's just to come over here. Corner table is gone. No uh, red journal for saving. 21 sacraments painting is gone. Living room table is gone. No magazine up on top. A little bit different TV. Same inventory. Same chair, same radio, same clock. Henry's room is in this game? Oh yeah, we're, we're here. We're in it. A hole to uh, look at Eileen's room. Can't open up the fridge. No chalky milk. Can't interact with the door. But... Door's there. And hey, look. There's a door here. I guess they put the door back. They took Walter's smelly corpse out of here and cleaned up the storage room and put a proper door in front of it. After Joseph went through all the trouble of uh, walling it up. No flavor text on the front door. Nope, nothing. Just a fun little visual Easter egg and a gun if you want, you know. Some extra bullets. And, uh, I don't know. For a lot of people, they probably saw this and were immediately like, oh, cool, Silent Hill 4. I'm one of those fucking nerds who saw this and was like, wait, what the fuck? We're in Silent Hill. Why is this here? This is Henry's apartment. Henry lives in South Ashfield. An entire half day away from Silent Hill. Whatever the fuck that means. So it's like, okay, whatever. It's fan service Easter egg. But come on. <laughs> Yoshio. I probably should just make that a command at this point. What are you doing over there, wiggly face? You want to fight? Ah. Oh. Could have sworn there was a command. There probably was at some point. Hey, a bird. Poor little guy. Are there any other birds around? Wasn't that a great cutscene? Wasn't that wasn't that a wonderful cutscene? Do you guys remember grass? Remember what grass looked like? The setting that bird free. That sure made Murphy remember. Oh, 
Another side quest. Hey, give me that flashlight. Didn't I already have a flashlight? Do I just have an extra one now? that for a med kit. Okay. At least the music is a little different. The environment's a little different being in like the big abandoned bank. It still just feels so detached from everything else. Brahms. Yeah, just ask the, the little baroness. DMCA. Yeah. Always smooth sailing on Lake Toluca. Which is why countless ships have gone down and there are multiple monuments to all the people who've drowned and all the ships that have sank. There's an entire game based around it. That's what the whole plot of Silent Hill the Arcade game is. It's all about the little Baroness. A ship that sank. Same repeating textures and things again. Ah, the most valuable object. Chair. I'm just going to smash it for fun. this noisy alarm to deal with. Yeah, you weren't counting on me having the power of gun. Oh shit, did I leave? It's like trapped in the little like lobby area. Didn't mean to exit. I don't think you're even supposed to normally exit that, right? 
Are the two saves that are open all still going to be open? Okay, they do stay open. Please no scream. Dresses as a thief and immediately robs a bank. I mean, why not? More character progression than we get otherwise. What are these enemies? Dirty ladies and prisoners with things on their face. Aren't they cool? <coughs> Excuse me. Why can I hear enemies, like, in the wall? Is that all of you? Is that all of you just being directly up here? Alright. Silent alarm. If only it was fucking silent. Well, it's quiet now because we did the thing. Triple heal. Hell yeah. Three med kits and some bullets. All for the cost of taking some damage and shooting some of my bullets. So that we basically come out even as though we had just never entered the bank in the first place. Hell yeah. Let's heal and reload my gun. We sure did that side quest. I feel very fulfilled now. We know so much more about the story and the plot. There's character progression. Thank God for the gamer score. Devil's Pit, a mile, county line, Ashfield. That's where Henry lives. 168 miles.
All right, so we saw Silent Hill 4, Easter Egg, went through that way. We did the Bankside quest. Read the bird. I think that's about everything over here. See how close I need to get to actually mark these sections of the map where the roads end. One of those things I need to start doing more in general with these playthroughs is actually bringing up the map and kind of showing the context of where places are in each of the towns and in like each of the games kind of all the different versions of Silent Hill Yes, hello. Spooky noises. Just a good old random spooky noise. Is this the one where Homer is? Sledgehammer. No. This one is all blocked off. Pistol whip, pistol whip. Oh shit. That's fine. He's loud as fuck. Storeroom. E pad. There's no zero. We'll have to come back to it. I think he marks it. Yeah. A lot of times you'll do like a different puzzle somewhere else for some of these uh, side quests. And it'll just give you a location where you go on the map. And uh, get the code to get into that door. I don't remember which side quest that is or not. Is that the following the ribbons one? There's a ribbon here. Oh my 
god, the engaging combat. Oh. Hey, what's up, nobody? The worst designed enemy next to the best designed enemy. There's no closers in this game. There's no abstract daddy anywhere. The prisoner represents a prisoner. But with a thing on his face. Because it's scary. And the lady represents his wife blaming him for the death of this his son as he tries to block it out. Or it could represent Anne Cunningham. Or anything because it's just a dirty lady. And you could attribute it to like any aspect of the story symbolically seen as female like I don't know looks like the kite I built with Charlie but that's impossible so we're finding little artifacts relevant to the story at hand but also stuff that's just sort of related to Silent Hill in general Things like the Hyper Blaster, which is a weapon in Silent Hill 1 and in Silent Hill Homecoming. And it's based on an actual light gun that uh, Konami used to produce. So some of them are like little fan service artifact things. Some of them are things like that, where it's like Charlie's Kite. Stuff that's relevant to the story. If I would have brought the shovel, I can always go back and get one. DMCA. Can't remember. I think there is a shovel close by. That's a rake. It's not open. Silent Hill could have used a DJ. Did in the elevator. Got him, Dr. Grimm. It did. I mean, kind of. Is it more game show host than radio DJ? I mean, you're hearing him over, like, a radio speaker, I guess, but... I don't know. Oh boy, the storm is getting worse. That means enemies are more likely to spawn and they'll be more dangerous. That's a mechanic that's in the game. Did I leave that shovel? Oh, I thought there was one like right over here. Nope, not in here. I just walked near it. Oh, 
Oh my god, enemies. They are spawning. Oh my... He's so aggressive because of the storm. I can't handle him. Leave me alone, sir. Another battle axe. That's not a shovel. And we're back on this side. Quest for the shovel. I know at one point I used to have a map with everything marked out and where all these shovels were across the entire game just for trying to help uh, route out the uh, surprise ending for speedruns. Where people had gone through and I know uh, Droogy and a few other people had worked on stuff like that early on. As far as just kind of mapping everything out, what was the fastest way to go through, where you could find shovels, and start digging up each of these artifacts. Here's a stand where we place an item for an entirely other side quest. And a homeless man. Oh my god, the music sting right as we see him. Hey, what's up, bud? Damn rain never lets up, does it? Man can catch his death out here. Of course, if you could spare something to eat, I could show you another way to get around town, keep your head dry. What do you say, friend? That's a fair trade, ain't it? Okay. I will feed you these nails. Those count as food. Wish I could, but... I don't have any food myself. <laughs> well, if you find any, you be sure and come back here and old crazy Homer will show you a few secrets about this place. Safe travels, friend. Keep dry. Why do they call you Crazy Homer? All right. Thanks, Crazy Homer. If I find a candy bar for you later, I might return it to you. No guarantees, though. Gotta say, I'm getting sick of the side quests already. <laughs> Anytime I sit down to do these story playthroughs and start trying to, like, mess around with side quests and stuff, I'm just... Ugh. Why can't it be more relevant? You know I'd be all over that shit. You know I'd do every single one, every single time, if they had even just the littlest bit of, like, more story or more lore or something neat to talk about or show 
but there's just like almost never anything to show for the side quests. time off for my friend. I'll let you know. What's up, Officer Coleridge? What was that about? Mm, uh, nothing. Hey, don't bullshit a bullshitter. Sewell's bad news, Murph. He doesn't do anyone favors. What are you in for with him? It's nothing. It's... Don't worry about it. For your sake? I hope so. I don't want to get your hopes up, kid, but the parole board's looking pretty closely at your case. Don't screw this up now. Not after all I've done to get you out of here. Don't worry, Officer Coleridge. I, I got it all under control. Just some unfinished business to take care of. What the hell are you doing in here anyway, Murphy? You're, you're not like these guys. I told you, sir. Car theft, resisting and evading, and... Uh. Yeah. You stole a police cruiser and let him on a 10-hour chase down the eastern seaboard. What makes a guy with no priors and a clean sight do something that stupid? I think you at least owe me the truth. Maybe I just needed to escape from the world for a while. Yeah, well, you just steer clear of Sewell and... Do your homework, right? You got it, Chief. It's really brief there, but in the background, you can see on the wall of his cell, he's got photos of Charlie. And there we get uh, some exposition from Officer Coleridge, from that flashback. That's what Murphy did to get arrested. Stole a police cruiser, led him on a 10-hour chase. Did all that on purpose so that he would get arrested and go to the same prison as Patrick Napier, which somehow he managed to do that. You, It's not entirely sure what jail or prison he'd end up in. There's no guarantee that doing anything would, like, put him in the same prison as Napier. But, lucky for him, he got his opportunity. Memorandum. Ryall State Prison. Parole Committee. Glenn Milton. Prisoner Pendleton. Murphy. Parole status. This letter is to inform you that parole has been approved for Prisoner Murphy Pendleton. 273A, effective June 26th. Mr. Pendleton has met all qualifications for early release and by all accounts is a model prisoner. We feel he is prepared to make the successful transition from a prisoner to citizen. Furthermore, uh, further, due to the nonviolent nature of his conviction, it is our opinion he poses no physical threat or danger to the general public. Please feel free to contact our office should you have any questions and or concerns. Respectfully, Judith Zaragoza, Parole Committee Chairperson. So Murphy, you know, he was on good behavior. He was uh, going to get parole. He was going to be potentially released. Got the texture pop in. But he still had his own personal motives. His whole reason for doing all that shit and getting arrested and trying to get into the same prison as Napier just so that he could have that chance at revenge, that, that opportunity to kill Napier as revenge for killing his son, Charlie.
but in exchange for that opportunity to that freight elevator in exchange for that opportunity he uh had it all arranged by officer Sewell Sewell wanted him to kill someone else he said hey I can set it up you can get your revenge against Napier but you'll have to kill somebody for me that wound up being Anne Cunningham's father officer Coleridge spooky whispering What could it be? Is it a cheap jump scare and monster fight? Ah! Oh my god! A stage five clinger. Why does it feel like the screams don't really match the situations? Uh, because they don't really. They just recorded the voice actor doing a bunch of different screams and kind of stick them in all over the place. It's it's comical. Like it it's funny after playing this game so many times and hearing Murphy's screams. And all the different places where they are. I don't know. It it just gets funny. It's it's always funny. Pupper. can instantly change what side he's barking at. Let him out. Internal memorandum. Ryle State Prison. Captain Brian Handley. Handley? Handley? Zoom in and scroll up to it. Handley. Warden Glenn Milton. Status update. Internal investigation. For our recent conversation, my department has initiated an aggressive internal investigation into the prison guard staff. In order to keep you apprised of significant developments, please note that we are paying particular attention to the activities, past and present, of Corrections Officer George Sewell. We have received an eyewitness testimony from Corrections Officer Frank Coleridge that suggests CO Sewell has been engaged in, in a number of illegal activities in the course of his duties. Other than CO Coleridge's testimony, however, our evidence regarding Sewell's alleged violations remains circumstantial at this point, and our investigation continues. I will keep you promptly apprised of any new findings. So, this is why Sewell was trying to have Frank Coleridge murdered. This is why he wanted that deal worked out with Murphy. Was he had been doing these, like, sort of scummy side deals and stuff with prisoners for a while. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that he didn't want it getting out. He didn't want to lose that position that he was in. And uh, Coleridge was essentially ratting him out. He was telling the rest of the uh, department about him. All the rest of the uh, corrections and the warden about him. <laughs> the 
little scene of the uh, silhouette of the butcher or the butcher might as well be the butcher, the boogeyman, the bogey main. And uh, he's killing Patrick Napier. That's Napier from like the very beginning of the game. Same screaming and stuff from when Murphy was attacking him. And again, if you kind of think of this game from Anne's perspective, she is seeing Murphy as her boogeyman. Like, to Murphy, it is Patrick Napier. But to Anne Cunningham, it's Murphy. So if you view Murphy as being that, that person in the scenario, the boogeyman, It makes sense that we would see him as Napier's killer. Basically, since we're kind of seeing things from Anne's perspective, seeing that glimpse of uh, the boogeyman being the one who's killing Patrick Napier. Let's see if this works. has been drained. Damn. Another dead prisoner. Wires still around his neck. Hands are like tied around the pipe. Security card that we need. Oh no, it's a tense moment. The water is rising. Whatever will happen if we don't make it out in time? Oh no. No, no. Remember earlier at the very beginning of the game where there's like barely shin deep water and Murphy refuses to go through it. It treats it like it's an invisible wall. And he's just like, that water's too deep. But look at this. See it just like fucking vanish. Are you like this? You're not the real fuck. If Murphy doesn't yell out fuck's name, it's not fuck. They're imposters. Oh, did we give up on the spooky music? Did we give up on trying to loop the spooky music? Oh, see, fuck. If, if it was fuck, he wouldn't have killed the dog. These are just assholes. Ow. Oh, right. That has no more bullets in it. That's okay. We have an infinite box of wrenches. We'll use that.
Oh, even better, it's crowbars. Oh. <laughs> Look at this fucking... Incredible combat. Oh my god. Throw it. Yeah. Throw it, Murphy. Yes. That's all I wanted. Forgive me, pupper. I'm so sorry. Frank Coleridge on the security monitor to the left. The wheel man. DJ Rick's playing the tunes you want to hear, year after year after year. We've been together a long time, silent here, and we ain't done with each other yet. You see, DJ Rick's got an important news flash for y'all, so perk up them ears. DMCA. Another message from Bobby Ricks. He knows a way out of town. That is literally our entire goal. We wrote it down in our journal. What's our objective? Escape from Silent Hill. Also, maybe stop the patrol cars if we uh, if we get a chance. Not a big deal. But mainly, we just want to get the fuck out of this town. It's all Murphy really, really wants. Oh yeah, also UV light. See, Murphy just throws the other tr the other fucking normal flashlight on the ground. He's like, don't need this anymore. Because this one does both. A regular light and a UV light. And they even show you some clothing covered in semen. Just to show you how it works. Just for fun. Just for an example. All right, let's go to the archives. Welcome to the Silent Hill Archive and Library. Go ahead and take the fire axe. We're going to need it anyway. This is your respawn point. Since uh, people brought up like soft locking this game by throwing axes when you need them, like out of bounds and stuff. But you can see it's already respawned one. It's an infinite spawning point for axes. Oh my god, it's Torso! What have you done? What have you done to him? Hmm. 
<laughs> you're eating. I don't know if that's ever a great idea, Rory. Not while uh, watching these streams. Not during the Silent Hill playthroughs. Yeah, you need to be able to get through this. Which is why they've got that infinite spawning point for axes. Be dirty lady. Disney magic away. Yo, what's up, Maxi? Also eating? Bad idea during downpour. Yeah. Bad idea during most Silent Hill games, I would say. I've seen so many people comment on that at just different points. Silent Hill 2, it's like the first time you meet Eddie and he's just losing his guts in the fucking bathroom. People are like, oh god, I'm eating. Or Silent Hill 3, people who like tune in that are eating and they get there like right at the very end. So it's like right when right when Claudia is about to eat God. That's always a good time. Hey, welcome to Shepherd's Glen. Remember homecoming? Can't get through. I like how you can already hear the, uh, you can hear the weeping bat up there. Oh my God. That could have seriously injured somebody. All right. Classical civilizations. Rome, ceremony known as taking the auspices. Central to this practice was the augur, a priest who would examine the movement and behavior of birds and extrapolate from it the will of the gods. For a time, war, politics, and commerce were driven by these specialized priests. I always thought there would be more to this stuff that you can find. Like, okay, got this specific book, set of books that you can find stuff for using the black light. There's like things written down in the pages. Down there at the bottom, like somebody hand wrote part of a code. But from what I remember, it's not actually used for anything. Maybe it's a side quest thing that I'm misremembering, but... I don't think that winds up being used. There are some other, like, slightly more important things that you can find using the, uh, the UV light. Not really a lot for the most part. 
over here and fight. Come over here and fight. Where you can't do your cheap drop down. Locking. Oh. <laughs> Best Silent Hill ever, right? Just look at this. Look at how amazing this is. Worth it. We got a note. Internal memorandum. Ryle State Prison. Warden Glenn Milton. Captain Brian Hanley. Prisoner Patrick Napier. Deceased. Concerning the recent unsolved murder of the subject named prisoner in our facilities, a full and complete review of all isolation and segregation procedures will be undertaken by you and your staff. With findings turned into my office no later than close of business, uh, 21st November. Included in your report will be full investigation results regarding Napier's murderer, including those responsible for overseeing the victim's activities during the time of the incident, specifically how another prisoner was allowed access to the segregation area. Please note your guard staff is not exempted from suspicion and should be treated thusly. This investigation should be considered your highest priority. I am determined that we will restore Ryle's reputation as a top-notch prison facility. Consider this your first and last warning. Warden Glenn Milton. So... How did they get this? Yeah, see, Murphy recognizes it. He's wondering, how did they get this? Representing, you know, Napier's murder... That happened while he was in custody. So it's one of those bits of evidence in the game, finding this stuff that leads towards that, you know, murder actually taking place, that Murphy actually was the one killing Napier. But it also leaves it sort of open, considering, you know, there's no details listed on it. So it could also just be Napier uh, getting killed by Sewell. Because depending on the ending that you get will change whether or not, like, Murphy has or hasn't killed. I don't know. It's all a bit confusing. Tom Hewlett himself even said that that was a mistake and that there were certain endings in the game where... It's expressed that Murphy didn't kill Napier. That was supposed to be different. It was literally just a glitch, like a different scene is supposed to play or not play. Again, you can go out of the way to look in these books. A little bit of backstory on them. But nothing super relevant, you know? You would think that this would be... Let me look at it again, if I can. There you go. Concept of using prison as a punishment for convicted criminals is a relatively new one, so... Yeah. More books talking about prison. 
and you uh, and you figure out the symbolism. In America, especially, high re-arrest rates imply there is no rehabilitation or good behavior. The once convicted a criminal's life is forever linked to wrongdoing. So, things like that. What's the stamp? See, that's what I mean where there's like little handwritten notes throughout uh, some of these books and things that you can look at. As far as I know, it's, it's nothing significant. We don't learn anything really about that any of the numbers and stuff that are written or like the actual stamps and symbols that we sometimes see it's just something for this library or if there's something more to it because it's one of those things that to me it always felt like there was there was maybe supposed to be more maybe like another puzzle or, or some other thing here but Who knows? There was definitely a lot of cut content, according to Tom. Literary Masters Eastern Europe. Talking about Kafka. Franz Kafka. More interesting readings of Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis have emerged in contemporary criticism. For example, scholar Paul Schiebel writes, while it's possible Gregor's transformation was a matter of bad luck, more likely uh, is that his insect malady was self-inflicted as a way to escape from society. Double's argument focuses uh, most acutely on the latter half of the work during the time when Gregor adapts, adopts the fears and behaviors of an insect. One need only look at Gregor's room, a fortress built of discarded objects, to see a prison of his own making. More prison references. Gregor, in fact, wanted to be unwanted, so he created a world barricading, uh, barricaded behind unwanted things. The work chronicles his desire-driven descent from human being to exoskeletal prisoner that led slowly but inevitably toward death. Another important work from Kafka that still remains pertinent today, especially whenever the merits of capital punishment are discussed, is his 1919 short story, uh, In the Penal Colony. This deep, uh, deeply disturbing story tells of the last use of horrific execution uh, device that slowly kills the victim over a period of 12 hours, during which his crimes are literally carved into his flesh. The prison in which this ingeniously gruesome device is utilized has decided to retire the machine but the executioner that operates it seems to have an abnormal love for the elegant violence it inflicts, describing the spiritual ecstasy which grips some victims during the last hours of their life. In a truly Kafka-esque twist, the executioner decides to swap places with the condemned prisoner during the machine's final use, hoping to achieve the same transcendence through violence that he has inflicted on so many before. But because the machine has fallen into... Damn. Murphy's not allowed to turn the page. Guess we'll never know. But yeah, it just kind of seems like more really blatant symbolism. More prison reference. More you are your own prisoner. You build up your prison around you. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. It feels uh, much too on the nose. They focus so heavily on just like the prison aspect of Murphy rather than all the other aspect of his life. Looks like somebody has specific taste in entertainment. Yeah, somebody does. Someone's got specific ideas of entertainment that involve enjoying downpour. Okay. I'm not here to judge.
And that slow pan up the legs would say it was Murph. <laughs> I'd say it was whoever directed the cinematography for the scenes and designed the enemies and monsters and overall thought of this whole thing. I blame them. Spooky mannequin lady laughed at me. Oh, another book we can actually interact with. Etymology Volume 3, The Honey Bee. The bee is an interesting insect and one that has quite a bit in common with us humans. Bees build and live in societies, hold down jobs, and communicate in a symbolic language, just like us. These commonalities extend even further. Bees build prisons. Oh, prisons. Do you get it? Prison. Prison. Did you know prison? Are you aware of the symbolism of prison? These tiny penitentiaries are offset from the rest of the hive and are used primarily to detain hive beetles, pests that threaten the safety of the bees' home. Before long, the sentence is delivered and the death penalty rendered via lethal injection. The death penalty, lethal injection... Prisons, tiny penitentiaries, bees are just like us. Solitary honeybees are typically docile and rarely attack unless provoked to the extreme. When the bee does choose to attack, the single act of retribution is almost always fatal for the bee itself. The barbed stinger of the honeybee pulls the lancet deep into the skin of the victim, injecting one milligram of apotoxin. When the bee attempts to flee the scene of the crime, it finds that a large part of its abdomen, guts, nerve, and muscle tissue are torn from its body and left behind. Eviscerated, the bee dies shortly after, paying the ultimate price for revenge. What? You're saying that revenge is bad? You're saying that revenge is bad and can sometimes result in paying the ultimate price, your life, just to get revenge? And that also tiny penitentiaries? The bees shown here went to prison for revenge. <laughs> yeah, like, it's literally one step away from that, Maxi. Why? I don't know. I... I find that kind of shit funny. It's just so blatant. And so lacking subtlety. It's just, it's funny. Funny. You can hear Napier yelling and screaming from the other side of this door. I know the combination to that door. I'm tempted to just put it in and go right on with this segment. But we'll explore. We'll go explore the archives for a bit. E chord is now in session. When you lose someone you love. I, I get that that's supposed to just be like maybe the name of the picture, but you just see this picture over and over like it's a copy pasted asset all throughout the fucking game. When you lose someone you love. It's like Anne lost her father, just like. Murphy lost Charlie. But the way it's titled and the way it shows it over the image. Maybe I just spend too much time on the internet. But isn't that just kind of like a meme form format? Where you just have like a reaction image with text. Someone looking sad. It just says, when you lose someone you love. Maybe they were just way ahead of their time with memes. 
they made downpour. Another keypad. POV, you lost someone you love. Bitch slapped by a slutty ghost. Please stop it. Please stop it. else good in here just a barricaded area great that music stinger starting to sound like friday the 13th again the room that has a door that you can't interact with yeah it shows that there's supposed to be a door here No, very good maps. Spooky sound of footsteps leading into the toilet. Trust yourself, Mark. You know more than you think you do. Ah, uh, it's the ghost of Frank Coleridge. Talking to you way too comfortably while you're trying to use the bathroom. Ghost poops. of wisdom or flush in the other toilet no oh there's another book How many lines before this one mentions prison? Native American spirituality. The majority of the tribes believed in manito, or spirit beings. Contrary to the Western idea of spirits as part of the human psyche or personality, manito is something inherent to all things, animals, trees, the earth, and even machines. They were seen as both individual spirit beings that could be contacted and as a universal spiritual energy that flowed through everything. As the more universal Manito connected all things and non-life, 
Shamanistic tradition suggests ways to bend or manipulate this energy to create a desired effect. Blessing a newborn, dancing to summon rain, or using herbs to heal injuries are just a few of the many ways in which the natives sought to utilize the Manito. However, overuse could theoretically break the relationship between a people and the Manito. Okay. It didn't mention prison. So many readings to be done. But we're learning about spiritual energy and Native, Ameri Native American spirituality. That's kind of relevant. They talk about stuff like that in the Book of M Memories, Lost Memories. Book of Lost Memories. The Book of Lost Memories in Silent Hill 2. There's way too many things that have similar names. Too many books, too many memories. Both of the lost and the shattered variety. Hey, look. The demon Samael. Remember that? Remember Silent Hill 1? Lost memories of shattered books. Seems cool to an explore a haunted town sort of way. I mean, this game, if it would have been more interesting, you could make an entire game out of that. There's loads of people who do that kind of stuff in real life. Where they go to, like, supposedly haunted towns or ghost towns. And just, like, creepy places in general. And go urban exploring, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. Um, you could have had that sort of appeal, that kind of feeling to the game, but I don't know. So much of it is just kind of dry and boring and bland. Every once in a while, yeah, like, hey, look, a corpse and a gun. Press right trigger to fire. We're getting tutorials about, I've like already gone through a whole bunch of ammo. Still get the tutorial for this gun. Nice. ID card. Isn't there supposed to be a uh, another cutscene? Or not a cutscene, but just like a different camera angle when you get that card? I feel like there was supposed to be a camera angle when you picked that up that I didn't get. Oh, got an ID card. Make a little bit of progress. Stop it.
we can go upstairs and go through the door with the keypad. The Silent Hill game, you never know if you'll need that or not. That's fair. He doesn't he doesn't know how much information's going to be needed for the solution. Go. Another book. Settlers came to the Americas seeking religious freedom, a promise which certainly appealed to Gnostic practitioners of varying faiths, ranging from pagan to Judeo-Christian, even ancient Babylonian traditions. After hearing tales of the place of silent spirits, many made pilgrim uh, pilgrimages to what is now called Toluca Lake. One such pilgrim was Professor Horace Holloway, Holloway, who wrote in his diary, Stepping foot on that ground, even a fool could sense its sacred nature. Surely this place is the one for which we have sought. These groups studied and gradually integrated the religious practices of the native tribes, often interpreting deities and rites in terms of their personal traditions. In this way, figures such as Metatron, Semiel, and Molech were brought to the New World, as well as varying divination practices. Ornithomancy, scrying, gyromancy. So they're trying to give, like, history of the cult and their beliefs and practices and things like that, kind of how it started. But it's weird to see such a effort to put in lore about that in a game that has nothing to do with the traditional cult or beliefs or anything like that that were in the previous games. Like, that's not a part of this game at all. It's deliberately left out as being a major plot point of this game. The town's completely different. Spiritual power is completely different. Um, the cult is basically non-existent. But whatever. While it may at first seem peculiar that pious and God-fearing colonists would so readily adopt heathen or pagan rites into their burgeoning society. The incorporation of pagan traditions into Judeo-Christian orthodoxy is nothing new. During Christianity's spread across Europe, several pagan traditions were repurposed and absorbed by the church when recent converts were not so willing to abandon long-practiced rites and festivals based on seasonal and lunar cycles. Sadly, these same colonists that happily celebrated the Norse pagan holiday of Yule in the guise of Christmas, or the Celtic Sa uh, Samhain, All Hallows' Eve, the same colonists that were quick to root out witchcraft and devil worship within their community, as evidenced by the brutal witch trials that... Da, da, da. Yeah. Cool. All religions change over time, including weird uh, cult beliefs and religions, but this is a game that doesn't have that. This is a game where that is not a major part of the story. Hey, look, it's the Shepherd House. More posters and paintings just to be like, hey, remember this? Remember Homecoming? Well, shit. No, don't throw it on the ground. Thank you, Murphy. Brett Cairn, licensed clinical psychologist, helping individuals and couples cope with the loss of a child. So more very on the nose, kind of like background story building. So cope with the loss of a child. Couples coping with the loss of a child. So Murphy his wife going through difficulties seeing a psychologist after losing Charlie. 
Nothing else there. Okay. Let's climb up. I wonder if this will hold me. Didn't play Death Stranding, probably never will. Death Stranding's got a lot of note reading. A lot of reading emails and text and stuff like that. Honestly, I don't mind it. I don't mind there being lots of reading in a game in general, uh, especially for a Silent Hill game, as long as it's something interesting and relevant. Interesting and relevant. Those are, those are the two main things. This game is full of completely irrelevant like just fluff just things that are there for you to interact with and read and it's like oh okay i get it bees also have prisons like is that really necessary um i don't know if if it was more interesting if it actually built up the world or the characters or the backstory in like a more meaningful way then I don't mind there being lots and lots of books and reading and notes that's totally fine by me too much of it just feels pointless or obvious unnecessary issue with the emails in Death Stranding because they could have had a playback during deliveries. Yeah, that would have been nice. That would have been nice having actual, like, voicemails. No, don't get on the plank. Get off. This is unnecessary. I feel like a jump scare would happen there. Surprise! Sexy mannequin. Yeah, all of the balancing segments are super unnecessary. Like, they really serve no purpose. There's zero reason for them in this game. Again, I don't mind stuff. If they want to add new mechanics and new things to the game that are different from previous Silent Hill games, that's fine. It just, let it have a purpose. Let, let there be a reason for it. When it's just like, go balance across the beam to get over there. What's the difference from just like walking over there? Shut up. Wiggle the analog stick. Balance or die. Make your choice. It's just a needless thing to kind of draw out getting from place to place. And it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't mesh with anything else about the game. It doesn't mesh with anything else about the character. If he was like, oh, I'm injured from the bus crash. So walking is hard and balance is difficult. But I need to get to this area where there's no other choice but to balance. Okay, I get it. It's part of the, the character, you know. It's a result of the story happening that I have to focus so hard on these balance segments. There's a reason for it. But there's not. There's no no purpose for it. I pointed that out when I was doing the Silent Hill 1 playthrough a couple weeks ago. We referenced it earlier in the playthrough, but yeah, there was like, there's a key that you need to pick up out of a mailbox near the beginning of Silent Hill 1, and you have to run across a tree that's fallen down across a gap to get to it and Harry Mason just runs across the fucking tree like no problem you're not like tiptoeing and balancing like oh what if I fall he just runs over there reaches his hand in gets the fucking key runs back across 
and it's fine. Psychological report, Ryle State Prison. Dr. Wayne Sarah to Warden Glenn Milton. Psychological evaluation. Probationary hearing prelim. Blank blankety blank is a male, 43 years old, serving a blank year sentence for multiple felony accounts, including third degree murder and sexual assault of a child below the age of 14. So this is for Napier. He appears to be in satisfactory physical health. Really? Prisoner is currently being considered for probation. After multiple sessions with the prisoner, I have concluded he does not suffer from any psychotic or physical disorders. Rather, he has shown continually to have an inordinate interest in young children and manifest significantly predatory traits. As a result, I feel he poses an imminent danger to the community. Uh, should he be released from custody and is therefore a poor candidate for probation. So the same doctor that we found a psych evaluation for Murphy earlier, stating that he was going to most likely get parole. We can see from the standpoint of them evaluating Patrick Napier, we see what he's incarcerated for. Murder, third degree murder, sexual assault of a child below the age of 14. And he's, uh, surprisingly, not going to be eligible for parole. Also, he's going to most likely be murdered. Depending on the ending that you get, he's already been murdered. Have you ever died to the balance bits? Only, like, on purpose? I've done it just to, like, see what happens. Go slides that we're going to need for one of the puzzles here. Because we're doing all this wandering around to try to find a code for a door where we heard Napier screaming. There's scratches and blood all over it. The only way back from over here, right? Yeah. But it might be one of those games where there's the threat of death, but no actual dying. No, you can't actually die. You can fall. Say anything about this? Time brings truth. Leave me alone, mannequin sex ghosts. so many times falling off the edge at the Otherworld Mall in Silent Hill 3? 3 definitely has a few spots that I used to fall. Like, once I started speedrunning the games, that kind of changed everything with getting used to how I move through them and run through them, how familiar I am with, like, spots where you can fall and stuff like that. But three used to have a lot of spots that uh, I absolutely would try to move through too quickly or go the wrong way. 
and wind up falling when I'm like not paying a lot of attention. Where am I supposed to find a security card? Where do you think? Let's just keep looking. See, I've got the slides. I still need to get to the area where I can use the projector. Video archives. Static camera angles, directional controls. Tried to do it in a few spots like this. It just makes the controls go all weird. <laughs> How dare you blow up doll ghost? You almost dropped that cardboard box on me. Hey, Nub, if you finish Downpour by the time the Resident Evil DLC drops in Dead by Daylight, will you continue streaming or nah? Uh, not, I mean, it, not likely, but we'll see how I feel at the end of the stream. I am going to be playing a lot of Dead by Daylight this week, though. I'll, I'll most likely be on to stream... Once I wake up after downpour. You're listening to the DJ Rick show on WLMN FM, where the tracks are tight and the sweet melodies flow on and on. It's always a perfect day with DJ Rick, your on air friend to the end. DMCA. Thanks, Bobby Ricks. One, nine, and six. And because we're on hard mode, normally there is like a title up at the top of the picture to give you an indication of which digit, like is the first digit, second digit, and so on. But on hard mode, it just gives you the times, and you have to figure out the order and everything from there. Which is not too difficult. It's only three numbers. So you just trial and error it. And it's always the same. So once you know the solution, you get into the safe room. Um, that's it. As long as you can remember it, it's always the same. Every playthrough, every riddle difficulty never changes. This should be a readable book. Yeah. Conduct disorder is also related to psychopathy and sociopathy, marked by a near total lack of empathy for other living things and a warped morality defined by their own needs and desires book about psychology, common mental disorders, stuck inside of this it's nice Mr. Neighbor. 
Illustrated by Thomas Stepanitz. Hop into my van, little Billy. Yeah. Pretty fucking great image. Considering we're talking about Patrick Napier and how he abducted, sexually assaulted, and then murdered Murphy's son. Nice Mr. Neighbor. All right. Let's get out of this fucking place. Nine six one. The times showed on the uh, slides. dead prisoner this one's got the ID card that we needed for the elevator oh and born free the MCA me so what's it gonna be Murphy you and me gonna play ball with all your hard work for nothing Disney magic the room away I mean the way I see it it's sort of a win-win situation right guys like Napier They've got no business breathing the same air as you and me, right? Now, the courts and the bleeding hearts out there insist we sequester guys like him away from the general population for their safety. Can you believe that shit? For their safety. Now, let me ask you this. What about Charlie's safety, huh? So this is how it's going to work. I'll give you access to Napier. Make sure you get some quality time with that worthless sack of shit. I'll see to it no one finds him till I've had a chance to scrub the place down. Keep you in the clear. But in exchange, you're gonna owe me a favor. Think you can do that for me, sport? <laughs> of course you can. I know you're a man of your word, Murphy. You be a straight shooter with me, I'll be a straight shooter with you. Remember, Cupcake, you owe me one. So, we get a bit of a flashback there. To Murphy sort of making the deal with Napier. Getting his opportunity to go after Napier. But, in return, is owing Sewell a favor. Game's nothing but a bad fever dream. You hate it. I'm sorry, Blue Zebras. Uh, it's not one of my favorites either, but it has been a pretty long time since I've gone through it. And uh, especially gone through it and talked about it in depth. And hey, we're going to meet Bobby Ricks. An actually somewhat likable character. Compared to everybody else in this game, I guess. Bobby Briggs. DJ Ricky Bobby, Br Bobby Briggs. I can't even say it. Can't even talk. That must be DJ Rex. Oh, listen to that Silent Hill music. Listen to that those Yamaoka tracks.
Not perfect by no means, but it's not as drudgingly bad as some people make it. I would agree. I I used to really like loathe this one a lot more than I did or than I currently do. It's like I said, it's still not a favorite by any stretch. But I've seen how bad the series can get. I've seen what other stuff can happen when they really don't try. Shit like Book of Memories. So it's at least got something going for it. There there was some creativity there. There there were some decent ideas, just poorly executed, you know. Not a very experienced dev team working on it. Probably didn't have the time or the budget because it's late stage Konami at that point. Um so all things considered, like it could have been much worse. It's not a great Silent Hill game. It's not terrible just as kind of its own my thing. Part. I know nothing with any certainty, but just the sight of the stars makes me dream. Ah. Frank Coleridge, giving us some more powerful quotes and dropping that wisdom on us. My brothers and sisters was another rock and roll classic coming to you courtesy of DJ Ricks on this fine afternoon. Weatherman well, says there's a storm coming our way to spoil the fun. So batten down the hatches and snuggle up under the blanket with the one you love. Because it's going to be a rough ride. And speaking of rough rides, we got another dedication going out to my man with the plan. Murphy Pendleton. Somebody out there has got an eye on you, MP. So watch your back and keep it on track. Hey, man, come on in. Got a disc spinning right now, so you ain't interrupting nothing. <laughs> man, you look like you just saw a ghost or something. You all right? Not really, no. Good to hear. So what can DJ Bobby Ricks do for you? Uh, Murphy Pendleton? Like I was saying, what can DJ Bobby Ricks do for you, Murphy? Got a track you want to play, or...? I'm the guy you've been putting out the dedications for. I got the message. I came to find you. Afraid you got the wrong man, Murphy. I don't know what you're talking about. But if there's a song you want to hear or a dedication you want to make, I could... You're listening to the DJ Rick Show on WLMN-FM, where the tracks are tight and the sweet melodies flow on and on. It's always a perfect day with DJ Rick's your on-air friend to the end. Look, man... I came through hell and high water to get here because you called me. Now cut the bullshit, because I don't have time for this. Chill out, man. If you don't keep your voice down, you're going to get us both in trouble. And you do not want that. You don't know who might be listening. You understand? Thank God someone finally heard me. I, I can't even tell you how long it's been just spinning record after record after record, hoping someone... What the hell's going on here, Ricks? What is this place? No time to explain. If we're gonna get out of here, we gotta move fast. You getting this far tells me we might. Might even have a chance of getting out alive. What's the plan? Right. Listen, I got this boat. She's moored down at the marina. She's fast, real fast. Probably is some motherfucker ransack the studio and check the keys. I'll hotwire it. No problem. Uh, that's not gonna work. This place, it, it, it does strange shit to reality, man. It's like, there's rules you gotta, gotta follow, you, you know what I mean? Bobby Ricks? Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Who's it going out to? But I, uh, that's, that's nice of you to think of me. Yeah, real nice. Thank you. They're coming. Who? Doesn't matter. We gotta find those keys. Though in the silver chain says freedom. You can't. This, um. Pendleton. Put the gun down, damn it. We might have a way out of here. You. I need to use your phone. Sorry, lady. Calls come in, but don't go out. Just because folks want to be heard, don't mean they're willing to listen. See for yourself. What the hell's going on around here? No! Run! <laughs> 
Anne had a change of heart. She's back to hating us. She had a change of heart before where she remembered her father and then now she's back to fuck it, let's just kill him. You can play this game on Xbox One or you have to have the disc? I believe you have to have the disc. Because it's not, uh, I don't think it's available digitally. Homecoming is. Not downpour. Also, I just noticed on one of these. It's called Vatra. That's the name of the company that makes this game. The the devs, that's their studio. The DJ is a pretty good voice actor. DJ Bobby Ricks is, as I said, one of the better characters in the game. I like the voice actor. I wish they would have done more with him. Uh, instead, they have him give all these cryptic messages and we, you know, hear him on the radios and stuff. Everything leading up to this point. We have this whole little session with him. He talks about his boat that's really fast, which, by the way, we'll get to that boat eventually. And it is not fast. But, you know. It seemed like he was going to be more of a character there for a bit. And then, whoop, nope, he's just out of the game now. What happened to him? What happened to Anne Cunningham? You're just going to have to read the Anne Story Downpour comic book to find out. Because, yeah, that's, that's kind of what happens. Anne Cunningham goes into her own little weird Silent Hill scenario. And DJ Bobby Ricks is there with her get a little bit more backstory to uh, Bobby Ricks and his experience in the town and uh, a little bit more story with Anne but all stuff that they uh, just leave out of this all left out of the main game Already got the lighter, just the diluent. These kind of puzzles, where you're just like looking for an item, uh, slightly change whenever you're on different difficulty levels. So it'll put uh, the item that you need, like, in a slightly different room, different place. Different uh, thing in here? No. Here's our diluent. So yeah, for hard mode, it's out here on that table. If you're playing on like normal, I think it's in here somewhere. It's like in the back room in that little storage area to the side. And then if you're playing on easy, it's just like right here on the desk, right next to where you need to use it. Let's pour this diluent all over this big pile of laundry and empty cardboard boxes and set it on fire. Because that's a good idea. Oh god, not again. 
diluent. Whatever, it's paint thin. Everyone knows what paint thinner is. Let's call it paint thin. these chase sequences, why they exist and whatnot. I don't know. They really liked their idea in Shattered Memories and they were like, hey, let's do that again. Or they really liked the Red Void in Silent Hill 3. And they were like, hey, let's do that, but over and over without as much, you know, meaning or impact. This slows down the void. Just grab the invisible valve that you're supposed to know is there because of the reflection. thing, not me. Look, it just goes through the wall and catches you up like anyway. It is possible to die right here. Oh God. Sometimes Murphy will just like keel over when you're pulling the lever for that door and running through for some reason. Fatherly, fatherly Frank Coleridge advice and horrible screaming to accommodate it. What if the car hits you? You die. If any of that stuff falling hits you while you're doing those running segments, you're you're just dead. Wonder if it's possible to outrun the void without having to throw stuff. Absolutely. During the speedrun segments, you don't throw anything. You don't stop to do that shit. Not even once. This are a little bit more visually interesting, at least. This music is good. You get a glimpse of the wheelman there, Frank Coleridge.
see, this is why we don't need books about honeybees having tiny penitentiaries. We get the prison symbolism through stuff like this, like through these kind of visuals. Through auto scrollers. I mean, yeah. That is what's happening. This is all your fault, Boogeyman. Fuck you. that for an enemy? How about barbed wire halo of the sun with torso with spikes that shoots blood out its tummy? I mean, it's better than Dirty Lady. Or a shirtless man with thing on face. It's not even really an enemy, it's just an obstacle. cousin from homecoming Corso from homecoming and he's just got a really bad tummy ache oh. I don't think I ever took too much time to look inside these uh, cells during this part. You can see all the gear work and stuff down there. Guess that's why you die if you fall down. Sideways, just like the painting. You turn the painting upright, and the room turns upright. Also, spinning death wheels. What is this? Also, the clock puzzle from the Temple of the Ancients in Final Fantasy VII. Except even more stupid. Hey, second try. And a balance beam segment, because that's a mechanic for some reason.
I hope when they get to the Temple of the Ancients in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, it's just like that. I hope it's just like that. I hope it's a balance beam segment exactly like Downpour. Walking on the hands of the clock. Because there's already been balance beam segments in 7 Remake. <laughs> Don't jinx it. Which, uh, I need to play Remake again. Integrate just came out. I do not have a PlayStation 5. Is Integrated PS5 only? I thought it was just like a general update for PS4, like all versions. Oh, that's balls. Oh well. I just have to get a PlayStation 5. How hard could that be, right? Again, this, this game's got its moments. Things are at least kind of visually interesting. But the style just feels out of place. If that makes any kind of sense. This kind of segment makes me think of a lot of different horror games, but it doesn't really make me feel like I'm playing a Silent Hill game. The Wheel Man. There he is, Frank. Frank Coleridge, he is the wheel man. Driver is back. Who are you? I know who you are. Water slide. Little Ann Cunningham is a child. Ann Cunningham. Go back to back, just two comments in chat. First, I do enjoy his screams in this segment, and then immediately after, those freaking screams, man, lol. I don't know, I'm kind of torn on it. The screams, I, I feel, are funny most of the time. But I don't, I don't know for sure if I like that more than just your typical Silent Hill protagonist that never really screams or reacts during any real gameplay.
Ah, oh, my textures. Any place to take a nap, Sam. You know, you could get your death out here. If you're not careful. Got something for you. Oh boy, a letter. From St. Maria's. The old orphanage up there on the hill. No. This no. can't be right. Got your name on it, doesn't it? Seems plenty right to me. Of course, you won't know till you open it, will you? No. Enough of this shit. No. I'm done. I'm finished with the riddles, the mind games. Whatever I did to get here, I've had enough. I want out. Do you understand me? Do you? I understand you loud and clear, Murphy. Let's just quit this game. Son, you still don't get it. It doesn't matter what you want. As for me, I got mail to deliver. Goodbye, Murphy. Bye, Howard. Howard's a nice guy. Well, time to go run around Silent Hill some more in some very unsatisfying exploration and side questing. But before that, we're coming up on like eight and a half hours, so I'm going to take a short break so I can get up and stretch, go grab another drink, Check on my cats. So I will be back in just a couple minutes. We'll continue on with more Silent Hill Downpour. Thanks you guys for sticking it out and hanging out with me so far. I hope everyone's been enjoying the uh, the stream. I know it's a little bit rough talking about this one, going through it. I'm really trying to not be so negative, but it's hard, you know. It just it's not one of my favorite games. And I'm trying to be informative, but still uh, try and enjoy it and not just rush through it. But man, the more I'm playing it and just kind of looking around and being like, I really wish there was something interesting here. I really wish there was more to talk about with this. And there's just not. Ooh, it's tough. Makes me really just kind of want to rush through it that much more. So I don't know. We'll we'll still be continuing it. We'll we'll finish the whole game tonight, as is usually the plan. But I'm gonna take a few minutes and be back in a moment and we'll get back to